Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Center for Democracy and Technology's sixth annual Future of Speech online event. My name is Emma Lonzo. I'm the director of the Free Expression Project at CDT, and I'm happy to be welcoming you to today's event. This year's theme, the Supreme Court's pivotal term, takes the important online free expression questions appearing this term before the US Supreme Court as the starting point for three days of discussions about online content governance, intermediary liability and platform accountability, and what we actually want from the online services we use in our broader information environment. Yesterday, we heard some big picture perspectives about the questions the Supreme Court is taking on and what implications they might have for online speech and speakers and how online services approach content moderation. We also got an update from the Meta Oversight Board members about their latest policy advisory opinion that takes on Meta's controversial cross-check program. Today, we're taking a deep dive into the laws and cases that the Supreme Court will be ex examining in Twitter versus Tomna, Gonzalez versus Google, and very likely in the CCIA and NetChoice ca cases challenging the Florida and Texas social media laws. We have nearly a dozen lawyers at your disposal, so get your difficult questions and hypotheticals ready. Um, some quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, the final two days of the Future of Speech Online will run from noon to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time today and tomorrow, that's Thursday, this week. We are recording and live streaming all of the sessions on CDT's YouTube page, youtube.com slash sendemtech. So if you have to pop out to another meeting or you miss a session, that's okay. You can catch up on what you missed later on. Um, we'll also be taking audience questions throughout the sessions. If you're connecting through the Zoom webinar, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the window. If you're following on the live stream, you can submit questions via email to questions at cdt.org or via Twitter at sendemtech or on pretty much any social platform using hashtag CDT questions, hashtag FOSO 2022. CDT's communications manager, Elizabeth Seeger, will be monitoring these channels and will pass all those questions along to our moderators. We also have live closed captioning available through Zoom and on the live stream, and we'll be taking short breaks between some of the longer sessions in order to allow our captioners to catch a quick break. Um, now with that, I am delighted to introduce our first very special session of the day in which my colleague Samir Jain, who is CDT's policy director, will be having a conversation with noted First Amendment and Section 230 litigator Pat Carone. Samir and Pat, welcome and over to you. Great. Thanks, Emma. And Pat, I'll ask you to unmute later. <laughs> um, we at CDT thought it appropriate to use this occasion to honor and recognize Pat Grome for his many contributions to the development of the law concerning the First Amendment and free speech, particularly as the country's preeminent advocate around Section 230. This fall was the 25th anniversary of the Fourth Circuit's decision in Zarin versus America Online, the seminal decision that set the course for how courts around the country have interpreted Section 230 until now. Pat, of course, led the representation of AOL in Zarin and argued the case before both the District Court and the Fourth Circuit. I was fortunate enough to work with Pat on Zarin and saw firsthand his tenacity in the face of, frankly, some skepticism that Section 230 could possibly provide this unprecedentedly broad immunity to online service providers. I also saw how his advocacy was shaped by his deep convictions about the importance of free expression, which had been honed during what was by then already a distinguished career working for more traditional media companies, including his stint in-house at the Washington Post. Zarin was the first of many Section 230 cases on which Pat worked. He has represented a literal who's who of the internet industry, from Twitter to Google to Facebook, Airbnb, Craigslist, Yahoo, and many others. And he has been a thought leader shaping the development of the law through his writing and speaking, and as a leader in entities like the Media Law Center, the American Bar Association, the DC Bar, and the Student Press Law Center. As it happened, Pat was planning to retire at the end of this year. In fact, he and I had lunch in August, during which he eagerly talked about his retirement plans from spending more time sailing to traveling. Of course, it was only a few weeks later that the court granted cert in the Google and Twitter cases and decided to take up the interpretation of Section 230 for the first time in the 25 years since Zarin. I remember sending an email to Pat that same day telling him that if anything was going to give him second thoughts about retiring, it has to be the court finally taking up 230. And sure enough, Pat has temporarily delayed his retirement into next year so that he can see these cases through. Whatever the court does, there can be no question that Pat has played an indelible role in shaping internet law for the last 25 years. 
In honor of that, on the occasion of his impending, if slightly delayed retirement, we at CDT wanted to recognize Pat during this conference, which in many ways is shaped by his work. I wish we were all in the same room and could applaud him in person, but please join me in applauding him at least metaphorically. And Pat, congratulations on an extraordinarily impactful career. Well, Samir, those are incredibly kind words and I, I really appreciate them. And, and uh, I'm thrilled you now are, are, are playing a leadership role at CDT, which is one of my favorite um, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, which does such incredibly great and important work in this space. Uh, you're, you're very sweet to, to honor, honor me. You know, you were a big part of the brains behind the, uh, the Zaran um, uh, operation and strategy. And so I, I consider what we did on that case and um, everything that sort of has happened from there uh, to be uh, do a lot in a lot of, of ways to you uh, as well. Thanks, Pat. That's generous of you. Um, we'll talk about the legal issues in a bit, but I'm just curious, what are your emotions now that the court is going to be examining Section 230 25 years after Zarin? I've got tons of mixed emotions about this. Um, uh, it had always uh, seemed to me to be part of the Section 230 strategy over the decades to actually allow Section 230 issues to percolate in the lower state and federal courts. Uh, and uh, there was always such, uh, frankly, consistency in, in the way the law had developed over the decades that there really wasn't a good occasion for the Supreme Court to, to take up a Section 230 issue. There really haven't been any significant splits. Um, uh, but nonetheless, for whatever reason, the, the, the court saw fit to take the to take up the Gonzalez uh, case. Um, uh, there wasn't a circuit split. No one was contending there was a circuit split. But you know, after many years of of, of not you know, denying cert in two thirty cases, the court has taken one. It's an interesting uh, uh, development and uh, really a. A, a, a potentially momentous development. There are, I'm, I'm hopeful that perhaps in the end, uh, the court won't actually use the Gonzalez case as its first occasion to opine on, on Section 230. I think that there's uh, a real poss possibility, at least, that, that, the, that, the, that the Tamna case and the ATA issues that are issue in the Tamna case will actually end up resolving, the Supreme Court will find that those issues may resolve both cases on non-Section 230 grounds. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, so just to take you back to Zarin for a couple of minutes, um, what do you recall about the case when it first came in? Was it apparent from the outset how important the case potentially was? Well, it was, as you remember, it was, it was really important to us because uh, at Wilmer because it was going to be our foot in the door at, uh, in the online media space. Um, we had, you know, had done work for traditional media companies uh, over the years, had not really had an opportunity to do work in this space. So it was, it was super important to be asked by AOL to pitch for, for the case, um, and it was something we had been hoping to have happen. I think we pretty quickly did recognize that Section 230 um, was, a, was a potential important aspect um, uh, of the defense of the case. Although the lawyers who had been handling the case before us uh, had already um, in, in papers they had filed in the, in the case when it was pending initially in federal court in Oklahoma, had conceded that Section 230 was not applicable because Section 230 was actually enacted after the events uh, that gave rise to the Zaran case. And I think you've written in the past about how in some ways, it was really fortunate that Zarin was the first case um, that came through that it involved the interpretation of Section 230. Why, why, in what ways do you think it was? Well, it, it, it turned out to be very uh, fortuitous that the case, the first case for, for Section 230 to be construed in was a case that um, went up to the Fourth Circuit, uh, was heard by a panel that included then uh, uh, Fourth Circuit Chief Judge Harvey Wilkinson, um, and uh, that uh, was who was willing to really, I think, think hard about the case and write a brilliant uh, decision that um, 
was somewhat broad in its reach um, and um, really a ringing endorsement of our arguments as to what the statute meant. There's a lot of ways that that, um, that, that Judge Wilkinson would not have been you know, in a place to do that. Um, the, the case, the Zaran case wasn't filed initially in the Fourth Circuit, it was filed in, in Oklahoma. It ended up getting transferred. Um, as I noted before, the, uh, uh, the original lawyers on the case had, had, had essentially waived Section 230 as, as a defense. Uh, what, if, 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 if this had not been the case, if the Zaran case had not been the first to come up, probably the first uh, case um, to construe Section 230 would have been a case called Doe versus AOL which went up through, and you, you and I worked on that one as well, Samir, and that went up through the state court system uh, in Florida. And it was the horrible facts, the third rail of, of child pornographer and a pedophile who had um, uh, abused a, a, a neighbor and put up photos uh, uh, of, of his abuse of, 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 a, of a child sexually and um, just immensely bad facts. And um, we won that case. Then there were the claim was brought under um, uh, both negligence grounds and state law uh, uh, pornography uh, obscenity uh, grounds, and we won that case too on Section two thirty grounds at each level uh, of the of the Florida court system. Uh, and ultimately, by the time it got to the Florida Supreme Court, uh, the Zaran case had been decided and. And there was a, a five to four decision, I think it was. It was a one vote split amongst the Florida Supreme Court going in favor of AOL based on Section 230. Uh, and the majority opinion was largely a block quote of the Zaran, of Judge Wilkinson's Zaran uh, uh, analysis. Um, I'm not sure we would have gotten uh, the, uh, a, a majority vote of the Florida Supreme Court in that case on, this, on the reach of Section 230 had. Uh, the Zaran decision from uh, Judge Wilkinson been there as a as a guidepost. Yeah, no, and you know as that suggests, you know, I mean, Zaran's been really influential. I mean, some, you know, uh, someone's described it as having had a Pied Piper effect on the courts. Subsequently, you know, as as you've moved from Zaran, as you look over the subsequent twenty five years, are there a couple of other key cases that you think about as being particularly influential, or that the court now may look to as touchstones in addition to Zaran as it starts to think about two thirty? Well, I mean, an, another case that, I mean, uh, the uh, I you, you told me you were going to ask this question. The, the, I, I, I wrote down four cases um, as as other important cases in this space. There, there's the roommates.com case on Bonk from the Ninth Circuit. There's the Barnes uh, case, uh, uh, Barnes versus Yahoo in the Ninth Circuit, which you and I also worked on, um, and which was the, frankly, to this day, I believe the only case where I've uh, defended a, 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 a platform based on Section 230 grounds and not ultimately prevailed on at least some grounds in the case. The other two cases, you know, that I think have been really important in this space are, are Barrett versus Rosenthal from the California Supreme Court uh, and the Internet Brands case from the Ninth Circuit, uh, which also went um, uh, on bonk, I think, um, or at least was reheard. And um, uh, so those cases, you know, have are, are pretty important landmarks in this space. Um, uh, Barrett v. Rosenthal was an opportunity for um, a, a state Supreme Court not bound by the, uh, the, the federal uh, Court of Appeals precedents that had uh, been decided to date, but which um, uh, provided a ringing endorsement of the of the broad interpretation of Section 230 that, that Judge Wilkinson had provided in Zaran. The roommates.com case was, um, you know, involved um, uh, a, a, a roommates matching uh, a platform, uh, which ultimately was found to not be even covered by the federal fair housing laws because it was only uh, matching people in, in um, in roommate situations and the, and the law doesn't reach that far. So, so in fact, it turns out all of the Section 230 decisions in that case ended up really being sort of irrelevant because it was ultimately decided in that case that there was no uh, liability for match dot or for uh, for roommates.com. But that ended up with Judge um, 
uh, Kaczynski, then chief judge of the Ninth Circuit, being a really important decision in deciding the line between what is sort of uh, third party content or information provided by another information content provider and what is uh, and what is essentially partly first party content or content of the platform that that is for which Section 230 doesn't doesn't uh, provide protection. So that that has been probably one of the most important other cases in this space. Uh, Internet brands um, sort of pointed out some of the limits on on Section 230 immunity for whether, you know, is the activity that's underway really not publishing activity, but 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 something else. Um, so, uh, so Pat, I, I don't want to let you get away without um, asking you about the cases before the court now. Um, you know, the question presented in Gonzalez, sort of picking up on those cases that you were just talking about, is whether targeted represent recommendations are somehow different than displaying third party content and therefore shouldn't count as publishing activity protected by 230. What's your general response to that argument or claim? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that Section 230 you know, clearly should apply regardless of whether or not the uh, platform has played a role in selecting or curating content for the individual viewer. That is one of the most valuable things uh, that online uh, platforms can do. I mean, they, the, the internet will be useless uh, if there is not uh, some significant degree, degree of, of curation and suggestion of content to users. There's just obviously far too much uh, content out there for, for, for it to be meaningfully used if, it's, if, if there is not some significant role of the platform in recommending and curating it. Uh, I think that certainly as the, as the case law has been, as, as it's been decided, and I think based on the plain language of the statute, uh, there is a very strong argument that, that 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 the immunity protection doesn't stop when there is 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 uh, some sort of a, of a of a role of recommendation or algorithmic or or human or otherwise in the process. So, I'm I'm it would be a disaster uh, for uh, 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 targeted recommendations uh, if that's involved in the in the delivery of content for that to be a ground for the Section 230 protections to be removed since uh, that kind of content is just, or that kind of content delivery mechanism is, is just critically important to the usefulness of the statute. I'm hopeful uh, that, that the court will see it that way. Uh, or another uh, possible off ramp here is that, um, as I mentioned before, uh, perhaps the, uh, the court will decide that there is, that there is clearly no ATA liability for the platforms and either Tom nor Gonzalez and, and use that as an off ramp to not have to decide section 230 in this case. We'll see. Yeah, and we'll see. So I just want to close by asking, you know, when we were first litigating 230 in the aftermath, I think there was a small community, you know, of internet lawyers and uh, people at internet companies that recognized how important 230 was, you know, in the words of Professor Kossoff that it in some ways created the internet. Um, but, you know, you could talk to ordinary people and they wouldn't have the slightest idea what Section 230 was. Um, and that changed over time, right, to the point where, you know, President Trump sort of made, you know, made 230 a matter of headlines. He was even threatening to veto the National Defense Act over 230. I mean, did you ever envision that 230 would be this household term and front page in the culture wars? No, I, I thought of myself as a geek pra practicing in some little uh, corner of the of the legal universe, and uh, so I, I'm I'm uh, somewhat astounded by this. Uh, at the same time, it it is a critically important uh, piece of the foundation for today's internet and really today's information society more generally. Um, so. In retrospect, I'm not surprised. Actually, I, I, I didn't anticipate that we'd we'd, we'd see a, see two thirty at at this central spot right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. Um, once again, Pat, congratulations and thank you for joining us. And congratulations again on such an exceptional career. Um, and with that, um, let, we'll move on to the first panel of the day. Let, let me my, hand. My pleasure. Off. Thanks so much, Samir. All right. Thanks, Pat. Let me ha hand you off to Caitlin Vogus, our Deputy Director of CDT's Free Expression Product, who will be moderating the next panel. 
Thanks so much, Samir. Um, yes, I'm Caitlin Bogus, and I'm so delighted to welcome you to our uh, first panel of the day, Must Carry for Hate Speech, Implications of the Texas and Florida Social Media Laws. I'm delighted that we have four expert speakers who are going to be speaking on the panel today. With us, we have Harold Feld, Senior Vice President for Public Knowledge, Chris Marchese, Counsel at the Trade Association NetChoice, Evelyn Dueck, Assistant Professor of Law at Stanford Law School, and last but not least, Gautam Hans, Associate Clinical Professor of Law and Associate Director of the First Amendment Clinic at Cornell Law School. So welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the purpose of today's panel is to talk about the legal challenges to the Texas and Florida social media laws. And just for anyone in our audience who's not already familiar with them, I wanted to describe them briefly before we jump into the conversation. And I'd say both bills can be thought of as containing roughly two parts, um, one part being about content moderation restrictions and another part being about disclosure requirements. So for the Florida social media law, there's a prohibition on social media companies permanently barring the accounts of political candidates in Florida or taking certain actions on posts by or about political candidates during an election cycle. There's also a prohibition on social media companies taking almost any content moderation action on um, journalistic enterprises, which is very broadly defined in the law. And there's a requirement that companies be consistent in how they apply their content moderation policies. And with respect to disclosure requirements, the Florida law also requires social media platforms to publish standards for content moderation, inform users of rule changes, and notify users about when their content is actioned. In Texas, the law is slightly different. There, it prohibits social media platforms from moderating content based on viewpoint with certain limited exceptions. And it too contains disclosure requirements requiring companies to publish acceptable use policies, biannual transparency reports, and to notify users about removals and operate a complaint and appeal system that allows users to challenge when their content is removed. So the reason we're here today is because uh, lawsuits have been brought challenging those laws on First Amendment grounds. And in the 11th Circuit, the court held that the Florida law is likely unconstitutional when it comes to the content moderation restrictions, but it said that most of the disclosure requirements are likely constitutional. In contrast, in the Fifth Circuit, that court held that the Texas law is not facially unconstitutional in its entirety. So both the content moderation restrictions and the disclosure requirements there. The plaintiffs in those case, uh, cases, NetChoice and CCIA, have appealed the 11th Circuit's decision, as has the state of Florida, since it was a split decision on the content moderation and transparency aspects. They filed a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court, and NetChoice and CCIA are also widely expected to file a cert petition uh, of the Fifth Circuit's decision as well, although that is not yet due, so that's not yet been filed. So that just sets the stage for our discussion today and what we're going to be talking about. And I'd like to start first with Chris. Um, Chris, since your organization, NetChoice, is one of the plaintiffs in these cases, can you tell us why you decided to challenge these laws and what's at stake for your members and what's at stake for the internet as a whole in these cases? Absolutely. So first, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Caitlin and CDT, for hosting this great conference and today's panel. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, NetChoice is very interested in uh, making sure that the broader legal community is following our cases and, you know, making sure that the issues that are going up to the Supreme Court this term are widely known. Uh, so the reason why we chose to challenge both Florida and Texas's laws uh, was because they are the most fundamental threat to the internet as we know it today uh, out there. And both laws are truly comprehensive in their approach to trying to regulate the internet. We saw both laws as being completely unworkable. There was really no uh, third way to, you know, to comply with the law while also maintaining a safe uh, and usable internet experience. And so we felt that these laws were the best candidates to challenge because there just is no way to comply with them. But also if Texas and Florida had their way, we would not have the internet that we have today. And I know that for some, that's a good thing. They don't like the internet we have today. They believe there is a ton of censorship uh, and that big tech is throwing elections to Joe Biden and so forth. Um, I say to you, even if you disagree with content moderation decisions that are made, try to imagine the internet without content moderation or with very, very limited content moderation. Your speech, you the user, uh, your speech would be crowded out by the complete nonsense and truly vile content that others post. 
the social media websites that we all use would become useless. And because these laws would have that negative effect on the internet and also present such strong First Amendment problems, we felt that there was no way not to challenge them. Thanks, Chris. Um, so Evelyn, one of the big legal issues in this case, uh, in these two cases, is about whether internet platforms exercise of content moderation is a form of editorial discretion that the First Amendment protects. Can you tell us a little bit about the origins of the First Amendment's protection for editorial discretion? You know, where does it come from and what has the court said about why it's important to protect editorial discretion? Great, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Caitlin and everyone at CDT for organizing this and the entire event. I'm a huge fan of CDT's uh, important work. And so it's a, it's an honor to be invited and to be here. Um, so I want to start by underlining why the question that you're asking about editorial discretion is really important and why it's important in this case. And that's because there's sort of two uh, diametrically opposed characterizations of editorial discretion um, that are at stake. So on the one hand, you have uh, the platforms arguing that all of their content moderation decisions are an expression of their editorial discretion, just like newspapers express editorial discretion when they decide what to publish in, in their pages. Um, and so therefore, the First Amendment, as it does with newspapers prohibits uh, government regulation of that process and those decisions. On the other hand, uh, you have the states uh, arguing that there is no editorial discretion at stake here. And so that's a sort of irrelevant conversation. The First Amendment is not relevant. We can re uh, regulate uh, as we see fit. And this is the split that you've seen in the two circuits as well. So the 11th Circuit said uh, social media platforms decision, uh, content moderations decisions, constitute exactly the same kind of editorial disc discretion and judgments uh, that newspapers do. And so they trigger First Amendment scrutiny and like parade organizers, cable operators, uh, things that have been characterized as editorial discretion in the past. That's what we have here when it comes to platforms. The Fifth Circuit, by the other hand, flipped, flipped it and said editorial discretion, actually what you mean by that is censorship. Um, and that uh, the platforms cannot invoke editorial discretion as if uttering uh, some sort of First Amendment talisman to protect their censorship is the uh, is the wording and said, uh, this is Judge Oldham, um, Supreme Court cases do not carve out editorial discretion as a special category of First Amendment uh, protected expression. So in respect of that first category of provisions that we're talking about in these laws, uh, you know, we're getting to the transparency provisions later, but when it comes to the must carry provisions, like platforms have to leave this kind of content up. Uh, this is, this is the whole ball game. This is, this is what, uh, what will decide uh, the issue. And so, um, as Genevieve Blake here and I wrote about in a piece published on the Knight First Amendment Institute's website, which is what I'll be drawing on as I'm talking today, I don't hold them here as patently wrong. Um, to say that editorial discretion is not a protected category uh, under the First Amendment is just wrong and not consistent um, with the Supreme Court or Court of Appeals precedents, including in the Fifth Circuit where Judge Oldham sits. Um, it clearly is a distinct category of First Amendment protection, and that category covers decisions uh, not to publish content just as much as it uh, covers decisions to publish content, which is uh, is, is important because uh, when you think about it, you might think about decisions to publish content as an obvious kind of speech, but also the decision not to publish something to say, I don't want to be associated with that speech. Uh, that's also protected by the First Amendment. Uh, the most famous case here that uh, you know all of this sort of uh, flows from is Torneo, um, where the court held it was unconstitutional to uh, mandate that news uh, newspapers uh, give a right of reply to candidates, to political candidates, um, if they had published ed critical editorial content. Um, and the court held there that you can't do that uh, because the treatment of public issues and public officials, whether fair or unfair by the paper, constitutes editorial control. And it has yet to be demonstrated how governmental regulation of this crucial process, and I'm going to come back to that, those words, crucial process, in a second, uh, can be exercised consistent with the First Amendment. And like I said, this is then being carried forth to a bunch of other kinds of decision makers that you might not necessarily think are uh, editorial discretion like you do with, with, with newspapers, like, for example, uh, parade organizers in the curation of the, of the people that are in the parade. Um, Again, this has been repeatedly upheld in the circuit courts, um, and there's just kind of no, uh, I don't think it can be contested that this is a protected category. Um, but I want to come back to that process uh, comment in in um, in Tornillo, uh, because I think that's really important, and it goes to why um, the First Amendment protects 
uh, this category of decision making. And here I might part way with, with some of the other panelists, I'm not sure, um, because I think that, that Judge Oldham is right in, in at least one sense, which is when he says, you know, platforms can't just shout editorial discretion and declare victory. Uh, because we know in any case, uh, the naming a right doesn't tell you its content. You can't say, you know, you have a First Amendment right or, you know, uh, you have a right to be free of discrimination. Those, that's true, but that is not enough to determine what the, the, the right covers. Um, and, you know, we also have, you know, strict scrutiny and other tiers of scrutiny to determine can you, you know, are there certain, certain circumstances where that right can be restricted? And I think um, what the cases show is that the First Amendment, when it comes to editorial discretion, is not uh, concerned with speech maximization. That's clearly true. The, the, the decisions there are not just about the more speech, the better. If we chuck as much speech at this, um, uh, you know, that's the way we, we find our way to a perfect speech ecosystem, because clearly, you know, by covering decisions not to publish, um, that's that's not the ethos. And, and the ethos is something more like intermediaries, curators are an important part of the way in which we cr create a healthy public sphere consistent with the First Amendment and reflect First Amendment values. And so I think what that means is that there is a question of looking a little bit deeper as to how uh, that process works in every particular case. And it may be that social media platforms exercise editorial discretion in a way that is different to newspapers. I think, you know, sort of like if you said to the to, to the ordinary person, is that true? I think there would be, uh, that's a fairly intuitive thing. And so I think if you think about it, about like, what is that curatorial role that the intermediary is playing? That might mean that editorial discretion is a different kind of right in different kinds of contexts. Um, but, you know, this is new. This is we haven't really seen this before. And so this is something that I think will be really interesting to see how the court deals with. Thanks, Evelyn. And yeah, I feel like a lot of times this argument around Torneo and editorial discretion gets shorthanded almost into our social media platforms like newspapers. And we even saw that in the Fifth Amendment, uh, Fifth Circuit's uh, decision where the court I think flat out said, you know, they're they're not like newspaper, so they can't claim this um, editorial discretion, right? And Gautam, I guess coming to you, you filed an amicus brief in these cases on behalf of First Amendment scholars talking about the editor right to editorial discretion and Torneo and other cases. So I guess I'm wondering, how do you respond to this critique that social media platforms are not like newspapers and so they can't claim this protection? Is that even the right question that we should be asking or is there some other way we should be thinking about this? <clears throat> yeah, so let me um, reiterate the thanks that um, everyone's all the panelists have expressed so far. I think some people may know that I had the good fortune to begin my legal career at CDT as a fellow um, working on uh, privacy issues originally and, and have you know, broadened my scope to privacy, speech and surveillance. But so much of my thinking on this has been informed by Emma Alonso's incredible work over the last um, well, I won't say how long, but over many years on this topic and everything I've learned about this and the First Amendment I've learned from Emma, and I'm so grateful to her and to CDT's work. So editorial discretion, what is it? Why do we care? Um, Evelyn, thank you so much, I think, for giving a really great summary of, of what the court has said and, and the intricacies, I think, that you have just observed and, and that you, Genevieve, have written about. So I think that there's an there are some arguments about, you know, Social media companies are not newspapers. And for me, that's not super satisfying because the three core cases that I think of as being structured around editorial discretion, or at least um, you know, defending the, the, the position of net choice and, and other platforms are not just about newspapers either, right? Evelyn mentioned um, Hurley or uh, the parade case, and then there's also Pacific Gas and Electric, which is about advertisements on the back of envelopes. So this idea that this um, right of editorial discretion, though it originates in Tornillo, um, is being restricted to something like a traditional newspaper, I don't think is borne out just by the cases that are you know decades old by this point. Um, Another point here is that the, the states, and, and I think those who think that they have the, the correct argument at editorial discretion, rely upon two cases predominantly, um, Pruneyard, uh, a case about shopping malls, and then uh, Rumsfeld versus Fair, a case about um, my favorite place, law schools. And so what that has to do, uh, you know, the distinctions that they draw are basically trying to say, what's the better analogy here? And, and that's where much of the fighting or debate happens. For me, um, I think that both of those cases are really not relevant, and this is what we argued in um, the 11th Circuit brief that I wrote about a year ago now, uh, which is that um, 
Pruneyard is a very strange case, one that I'm actually uh, writing an academic piece on uh, because it, it has a strange procedural posture. It's not really about the First Amendment exclusively. It's also very much about the California Constitution's protections for free speech, which are much different in scope and in framing. They're much more of a positive right. And so the Pruneyard case, I don't think gets us very far, at least at the Supreme Court level, in part because the Supreme Court there very quickly dismisses um, the idea that the shopping mall has any of its own perspective of First Amendment rights uh, that could be in conflict with the people who were trying to sort of um, gain access to the mall for protest purposes. My theory, in which I plan to um, someday write about, supposedly this month, although a, a certain Section 230 case is taking up my time, unfortunately, is that really that case is much more about federalism written by Justice Rehnquist and his sort of focus on federalism. And so thinking about that as a First Amendment case without thinking about it in the context of um, the federalism issues in California's own constitutional provisions doesn't really get you the entire story. And then Rumsfeld versus Fair, you know, that's a unanimous decision. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I have a very cynical take on the Supreme Court, as I think some people know. And I think part of the reason it's unanimous is that uh, some people thought that the law schools in that case who were disputing their um, the, the federal requirement that they allow military recruiters onto campus because the law schools didn't agree with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I'm radically simplifying. But basically, um, parts of the those who thought that the law schools should not uh, be refusing the military were not going to grant law schools a sort of immunity uh, from from that under editorial discretion and those who thought that uh, the, the federal government had the ability to regulate um, person that would be damned, I think were also in favor of that outcome. <clears throat> so that that's part of where I think the disagreement's coming from. And you know, I think many of us anticipate that the court's going to grant cert in this case. I, I don't really, in these cases, I should say, I don't really see a way out of it. Um, and I suspect that there's going to be um, a lot of debate about what's the right analogy. You know, are we are, are the platforms more in the Rumsfeld versus Fair and Pruneyard category, or are they more in the Turnio Hurley PGE category? And the last thing I'll say is, and um, let me two, maybe two more things. One, the transparency piece I think is much more difficult and much more complicated. And I know there's some debate about, you know, the not only the trauma debate about um, transparency requirements, but also whether or not these statutes actually promote true transparency requirements. That's one piece. And then one thing that I don't know, the, I don't have a great answer to is whether or not the methodology of editorial discretion matters. So in PG&E, in Hurley, in Tornillo, you do have some level of human review. And obviously, that's not happening to the same degree on platforms. Does that decision matter for the contours of editorial discretion? Um, I know I, I think I, um, I know Daphne Keller had mentioned this argument to me at one point, and, and I don't know if there's a great answer to it. I don't think it should matter, but I don't know if that's going to carry the day. And that may be a, a relative to, um, of the important turning point in these cases, uh, if and when the Supreme Court grants review. Thanks, Gavin. That's interesting. And yeah, we're going to talk more about the transparency pieces kind of in the next round of questioning, because definitely want to dig in there. I agree with you. It's um, those are very tricky. But first, I just want to go to Harold, because um, we've been talking about editorial discretion. That is one huge aspect of the case. But of course, another aspect of these cases is common carriage. And so, Harold, um, I know you are a longtime telecom lawyer, lots of expertise on common carriage. I was hoping you could tell us uh, more about kind of the origins of that doctrine. You know, Texas and Florida are arguing that social media platforms are common carriers and therefore the state can require them to host content on a non-discriminatory basis. Um, is that you know right in your view? Should we be thinking of them as common carriers? And, and where does this doctrine even come from in the first place? Well, <clears throat> common carriage is a very old doctrine. It goes back about 500 years. And uh, it essentially yeah, says that there are certain types of quasi-public services where the cost of exclusion is so high that when you decide to undertake one of these businesses, you have an obligation to serve everyone equally. Uh, and we carried that over to speech in the 19th century, when we started to look at this in the context, particularly of the telegraph, we we have a long tradition of it with regard to uh, the post office um, and letter carriers and package deliverers and others, although that 
still had an element of the uh, um, uh, economic to it in the way that, uh, um, you know, sort of the original law applying to taverns, inns, carters uh, applied. It, it starts in the 19th century when we get to the telegraph, where you ask this question of, is this merely a conduit for the speech of others? Or is there something else that's evolved, involved here? And uh, in the late uh, 19th century, you have a number of uh, states that by statute say telegraphs are common carriers um, in uh, the, uh, uh, or you have courts finding by common law that uh, telegraphs are common carriers. When we get the telephone, uh, we again um, reach the same conclusion and Congress um uh, you know, ratifies this in uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, first in the uh, Mans Elkin Act of uh, 1914, but then particularly in the Communications Act of 1934, that the telephone doesn't have a First Amendment right of its own. Nobody thinks of the telephone company as the speaker. It's a person picks up the phone on one side and is communicating with a person on the other side. And in fact, what flows from that are things like the right of privacy that flows from um, these assumptions that the telephone company is what we would now refer to as a dumb pipe. Um, it doesn't make any editorial judgments. And because it's so essential um, in our economy and that we then by law say, and you must be a dumb pipe. You, the telephone company, are not allowed. One of the the important cases, um, which is now lesser known, is uh, um, actually one of the older civil rights cases, which involved uh, um, you know an effort by uh, uh, folks to shut off the telephone communication of the uh, uh, pre president of the local chapter of the NAACP uh, on the grounds that the local uh, sheriff um, you know uh, said, well, he's like a bad guy. Um, and I'm pretty sure he's involved in something shady. So you local telephone company should, as good corporate citizens, just pull this guy's telephone service. And the court, without getting into, uh, you know, the merits or not merits of these allegations, said, look, you know, telephone is a common carrier. You can't just you know, pull the plug on someone. There is a right of everyone to use this service and be treated equally, um, or as we say, not subject to unreasonable uh, discrimination. Um, and that means you can't decide, well, I don't like you, so I'm not going to carry you. Whereas um, in uh, the normal course of events, you can. Um, and uh, uh, the issue of common carriage um, which is different from public accommodation. And I, I, I have to take some issue with what Gautam was saying, um, both because we never discussed the Turner case in all of this, which is, you know, from a communications law perspective, there's sort of this spectrum where you have sable communication on one side, which says when it's a common carrier, the telephone, the right belongs to the to the folks at the other end, at each end, and not to the pipe in the middle, um, to... Tornillo, at the other hand, which says, well, newspaper, that's a individual or, or company actually affirmatively curating and making a choice to cable, which is kind of in the middle and says, well, you know, there's clearly some editorial right. But then another place where they get into um, the court says, well, you know, the, the cable operator doesn't uh, review the actual speech. Uh, of the individual channels, but they have an interest in selecting the right mix. So um, it's a yeah, it's a First Amendment interest, and so there's there's more of an idea of this being kind of a spectrum, although maybe not a full spectrum, maybe just one of three buckets um, when we're dealing with the uh, electronic uh, communication. And this is important to distinguish from Pruneyard and the other public forum cases, which um, emanate from an entirely different theory of. There are these traditional places where people can get together to talk, the town square, the, um, you know, the, uh, the public uh, parks, um, and those, because of their nature, take on this, again, kind of quasi-public idea. Um, and it's a related doctrine, but it's different and has a very different origin from common carriage. Here, application of common carrier is a theory that has been picked up, I will say, in part um, as payback for net neutrality, where you know, we've been arguing that 
uh, you know, the internet broadband internet access provider is basically the next incarnation of the telegraph and the telephone. It's the dumb pipe that sits between the two speakers. Um, whereas now they're like, well, okay, you know, if that's how this is going to play out on the internet, then we decide that Facebook and, and Twitter and all these others are just like broadband providers and should be treated, except the reality is they are not just like broadband providers. They do very different things. The speech issue of who is attributed to the speech, the speech that is on these platforms is very is attributed very differently um, by people than uh, the perspective of anything on the internet that you might access through uh, you know your Comcast or Verizon subscription. Uh, so. Uh, there is kind of a, a an unfortunate blurring of these different sorts of cases where there might be an overwhelming public interest in in moderating the speech right of the platform into just kind of one. Well, we got a bunch of of, of laws that let us short circuit the First Amendment. Let's just grab one and make it happen. Thanks, Harold. And I think actually one of the questions in the Q&A is kind of relevant to what you were saying. Somebody's asked how editorial discretion cuts across different online service providers that aren't social media. So things like content delivery networks like Cloudflare or even domain name registers. So I guess I'd add to that also, you know, how did the common carrier doctrine, I hear you saying it's a spectrum. And so maybe even different online services would fall differently on that spectrum and in those buckets. Yeah, I, I do think that this is a question that we now have to wrestle with a lot. And uh, I will add, this is not the first time we've wrestled with this back um, during the period where the Supreme Court was very you know, suspicious of economic regulation in the late 19th and early 20th century. The exception they had was for public utilities and common carriers. Those could be re regu regulated. So this became a huge do or die question of do we class this business as a common carrier or, or a public utility, or is it something that shouldn't be economically regulated? Uh, so we, we go through this in, in every, I don't know, every uh, 100 years or so when the technology changes. Uh, and um, there's a very open question uh, about uh, some of these. What is what does Cloudflare do? Should Cloudflare be treated? Does it look more like an infrastructure type company of the kind that we've traditionally said, well, that doesn't really involve a speech interest. That involves other people's access to a, a critical element of uh, uh, of participating in the economy or society, or is it something where we say, "Well, no, it, it's a means of speech," and the uh, um, and the uh, business operator has legitimate rights because they say, "Well, if I'm you know I'm associated with this speech, and if I allow Nazis to use my uh, DNS, uh, um, you know, uh, and or cloud uh, storage uh, uh, services, then people associate me with that, and I should be allowed to not protect that speech. I should be allowed to reject uh, that speech. We we have not really dived into this. We have kind of." looked at this to the extent we've looked at it at all at the sort of the parts that are closest to the consumer speech. So on one hand, the broadband internet access providers, uh, on the other hand, the social media platforms, but we haven't, uh, um, uh, but we haven't really thought about this in any deep way for the other elements of the stack. Thanks, Harold. Um, I know we could talk about this part of the law all day, but I also do want to talk about the transparency provision parts of the laws. And I do want to remind other folks to please submit your questions using the Q&A function if you're in the Zoom webinar, or you can also email questions to questions at cdt.org, or you can send them to us on Twitter if you send them to at senddemtech and use the hashtag FOSO2022 or the hashtag future of speech, because we are going to try to save some time for questions at the end. Um, but going on to the transparency parts of the Texas and Florida social media laws and taking it back to Chris, um, NetChoice and CCIA have challenged those parts of the laws too. And I guess I was wondering, you know, why? Why not be transparent? Don't a lot of your members already publish transparency reports and content policies? And what are your arguments against these parts of those laws? Sure. So at the beginning of this uh, discussion, Evelyn made the point that, you know, uh, advocates can't just go into court and scream editorial discretion. You have to give some context and some flavor and some detail. And I would say the same is true with the government and transparency. You can't just throw around, throw around words like, oh, we want you to be transparent, you know, consumer protection, 
uh, more information, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's all well and good, but it doesn't make a law constitutional. And in the cases of Florida and Texas, you know, it was pretty clear that legislatures wanted to enact a punishment for the way that social media businesses were moderating. That much was clear. And so their bills are kind of divided into the two uh, parts, as you described at the beginning. You know, we have the substantive, very direct, uh, intrusive provisions into content moderation. And then we have kind of these indirect transparency slash disclosure requirements. And, you know, the cynic in me says that the legislature might have expected that some provisions would be struck down as unconstitutional. And so they put in these backup, you know, transparency disclosure ones, hoping that the courts would apply a relaxed level of scrutiny. Uh, traditionally, disclosure requirements in some cases do get relaxed scrutiny. But the reason why we're challenging these ones in particular is because they are unduly burdensome, right? They are incredibly uh, burdensome to deal with. Florida and Texas both require uh, that the social media businesses communicate their decisions to individual users, as well as making those decisions publicly available. And while our members do provide a ton of information voluntarily to the public, in fact, every quarter they come out with reports on you know high level takeaways from their content moderation, we do not believe it is appropriate for the government to force any uh, private speaker to disclose how they exercise their editorial judgment, how they come to you know decide which policies they're going to have, how they're going to practice those policies, and when they're going to deviate from them. Right? A lot of uh, people seem to think that it is inappropriate when social media platforms think on their feet or change course, but that is just the nature of it. Right? Every day presents a new challenge. A lot we've already seen, uh, but a few years ago, teenagers decided to start eating Tide Pod laundry detergent. Uh, and you know what? There wasn't a specific policy in place saying we don't want content of teenagers eating household detergent and then encouraging their friends to do the same. And so they had to come up with a new policy on the fly. In Florida, there is a uh, transparency requirement that basically uh, kind of says that like you can make one change a month. You can change your social media policies once a month. You must disclose this. You must disclose it to every single user. And if you think about the Tide Pod challenge, right? Imagine trying to come up with a new policy, wondering, you know, is this our second of the month? Will the state say it's our second of the month? And then having to communicate that to every individual user. Imagine trying to explain every single content moderation decision made to each individual user, which is also a, a requirement. And it's not just a simple, you know, you must uh, flag it for the user that you have removed their content you have to give a thorough explanation, right? So these are not your standard disclosure requirements of like, you must put your calorie information in the nutrition label, or you must disclose accurate information to the SEC. This is not, these are not those kinds of transparency requirements. Instead, they are government infringements on free speech. And the government is hiding behind the pretext that they are disclosure slash transparency. But in reality, they are just attempts by the lawmakers to control how the internet works. And so we're challenging these provisions because we believe that they are fundamentally unconstitutional. Now, I know that some people think, well, what's the harm in having to tell users or disclose to users how many views their content has gotten? I will admit that, you know, at first blush, it doesn't seem all that problematic. But then you start thinking, well, what right does the government have to require that you must disclose views? How are you even going to be calculating those views? Do you want to necessarily be review, uh, revealing that for every single piece of content? Are there situations where it makes sense not to have views known, such as on Instagram, you can now hide how many views there are. Uh, and I think that you know, as we're getting into these more complex conversations about how social media and humans interact and you know, what are the best strategies for humans to use social media in a way that promotes well-being, you know, that might lead to a decision not to show people how much, how widely their content has gone. But whatever the case may be, these are decisions that are best handled by private businesses. And because it is part of their editorial discretion, there's the government can't get around that First Amendment right simply by calling it disclosure. And so while we are fully supportive of transparency, we do believe that for the most part, it should be voluntary as it has been, right? You know, our members do release a ton of information publicly. Uh, and this case in particular, both in Texas and in Florida, uh, you know, they kind of tee up to the court a decision 
on Zouderer, this 1985 case that at the time had a very limited holding. It said, in the context of advertisements, there is the government has you know an interest in making sure that advertisements present uh, you know non controversial and accurate information, purely factual. And so again, this is stuff like you know calories. That is a lot different than you know forcing people who are in the business of creating speech, of disseminating speech. Uh, forcing them to disclose things about how they come to those conclusions and how they practice what they preach. That is like going to the New York Times and saying, you must explain why it is that you no longer want to run, you know, op-eds from Senator Tom Cotton or going to the Wall Street Journal and saying, you know what, we don't think your coverage of FTC chairwoman Lena Khan is fair. So we would like you to have to include um, other, you know, fair and balanced voices. And if you don't, we want you to disclose that to the public. And so like, again, it's just inappropriate for certain things to have to be disclosed at the compulsion of the government. If you voluntarily want to disclose it by all means, you should. Thanks, Chris. And you mentioned the Zouder case, and um, that is the basis for, I think, the 11th Circuit's and 5th Circuit's decision upholding um, many of these requirements. I wanted to go to Evelyn to talk a little bit about that, as well as another case that often comes up in these conversations, which is Herbert B. Lando. Um, and Evelyn, I know you've been critical of relying on Herbert for you know arguments that transparency mandates are unconstitutional. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that case and about the criticism. And then also, you know, is Zouder the right case that we should be looking to instead of Herbert, where do you come out on the constitutionality of these issues? Great. And I'm really glad we're digging in on this because I think uh, often conversations, you know, get uh, focused on the must tram uh, must carry cases. But, you know, I, I have no idea what we're going to be citing net choice for in 10 years. I'm sure it'll be something, but it could be that this is like the, the Supreme Court's blockbuster ruling on transparency disclosures uh, and, and you know, um, that, we're, that we're citing it for all the time. So I think this is really, really important. And one of the reasons uh, why I think it's really important is I get a little bit nervous about a holding here that is focused on, you know, these particular pieces of legislation or these particular kinds of provisions that is broad enough to imperil a lot of other transparency provisions across other industries or more thoughtfully tailored uh, transparency provisions in um, in, in these contexts. And, you know, Chris is absolutely right that there's no question in these cases about the intention behind uh, these pieces of legislation. I mean, some of the statements from the lawmakers uh, in the various uh, states are, are pretty clear. Um, they're not they're not leaving us guessing, even if the face of the law itself looks relatively neutral. And I think that that, um, you know, that that's pretty telling. Um, but that I don't think, you know, I think we should be hesitant to foreclose uh, you know, more well-intentioned transparency provisions, keeping in mind that transparency has been something that we uh, as civil society and, and many of us have been advocating for, as Chris says, uh, for, for a long time and, and has been vo uh, voluntarily provided, but also is something that the court has often emphasized um, as, you know, uh, useful uh, when you can't do substantive regulation, when you don't want to interfere with uh, First Amendment rights, uh, the transparency, like in Citizens United, in campaign disclosure cases, um, uh, uh, it can be a, an important uh, supplement um, and 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 useful. So, um, and and you know, I'd love to hear from from Chris at some point about like what those kinds of laws might be used, what what might be possible uh, in their understanding and, and their framing of the case, um, if these ones are are uh, are you know struck down and, and impermissible. Um, so Herbert uh, uh, comes up a lot in this context, and you're again referring to a piece that I wrote uh, with, with Genevieve uh, for the Knight First Amendment Institute, if people want to get a deep dive on that. Um, but there is a statement in the opinion of the court there that says um, that no law that subjects the editorial process to private or official examination merely to satisfy curiosity or to serve some general end such as the public interest could survive constitutional scrutiny. Um, and so, you know, there's this idea that you can't have a free floating uh, just sort of transparency obligation on editorial uh, discretion. Um, and I think, you know, that statement is is pretty broad and pretty clear. But I mean, if you look at the decision itself, the, the court actually lower overturned the lower court decision that prevented plaintiffs uh, from questioning an employee of a media company um, and allowed uh, uh, examination, disclosure, transparency in this particular case. 
Um, and Justice White said, you know, courts across the country have long been accepting evidence going to the editorial processes of the media without encountering constitutional objections. So I think, you know, what the court is saying there is, sure, you can't have a free floating right. But if in, for example, defamation cases, uh, you are trying to get a particular piece of information that's relevant to the to the um, to the case at hand, uh, then you can compel discretion uh, disclosure. And so I think, again, we see the court adopting more purposive inter interpretation. Um, to what kind of transparency disclosures can be uh, 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 can be mandated. And so in some sense, Herbert is not really decisive either way here, I think, uh, because it's a very different kind of context. It was a judicial uh, overseeing procedure of a particular uh, case in a particular context, which is very different, I think, from these you know, broad ranging uh, 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 transparency mandates that apply um, uh, much more broadly on a general and ongoing basis. Um, as to, to Zadra, I mean, I think it's, uh, this is, you know, as you said, Caitlin, um, a, a case that has been applied by both um, the 11th and 5th circuits. Um, they did it pretty perfunctorily, pretty superficially. It was just kind of, there wasn't a deep discussion of this. And I think there does need to be a greater examination of, of how it is applied for the reasons that Chris said. Again, it was a very different context, but it is sort of, uh, it's not, you know, surprising that the courts reach for it, uh, given that it is the, the closest uh, precedent that we have for disclosures in a commercial context where compelled disclosures of purely factual and uncontroversial information that relate to a good or service uh, can be uh, 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 are assessed at a lower level of scrutiny. Um, and the court hasn't really given us anything else to work with uh, that, that, that's closer. And I think that's why this could be really, really important uh, in, in cases like this, because we might see the development of the law. Um, and, and because, you know, I think that there will be need to be development of the law to answer this question. Um, and, you know, I think there are legitimate questions to be raised about Zoutera as, as the governing standard. Daphne Keller has written or has talked about how, you know, Zoutera is so based on a consumer protection rationale, like you want to give information to the consumer about, you know, this particular product. And for many of us, that's not why we're asking for transparency from social media companies. We're interested in like the democratic self-governance rationales uh, from what, what social media companies are doing. And that's that's much broader. And so I think that that's uh, something that's different. And for, for the reasons that Chris mentioned, you know, the, the general versus specific disclosures uh, uh, are, are different as well. The, one, the last point that I want to make is one of the things that I do think is, is good about Zaudera and um, is worth keeping in mind is this idea of whether something is unjustified or unduly burdensome. And uh, and Chris talked about that um, and, and says, you know, some of these are really <laughs> very burdensome. And we see that in the 11th Circuit as well, where the 11th Circuit struck down one of the transparency provisions, which was, uh, you know, uh, reasoning in every single decision. And I think actually that's an example of Zoutera working pretty well. Like there are some transparency obligations that might be not unreasonable and unjustly uh, burdensome uh, and some that might be and that we can have these like as applied challenges and, and as well as applied challenges in the case if we're concerned about governmental abuse of the discretion and the, using it uh, for improper ends. I think that one of the things is that it's tricky to answer a lot of these questions in the abstract about transparency obligations and I'd be cautious about doing so and I think that there could be really, uh, you know, Space here for the court not to issue something too broad, um, but to focus on like as applied challenges um, and and uh, and, and focus on uh, giving something more specific because I do worry about you know if we are concerned about these laws and I myself have concerns about the way that these laws might be applied and the reason behind uh, applying them, not uh, you know uh, throwing the the baby out with the bathwater for other kinds of transparency provisions um, that might be more thoughtfully tailored. Thanks, Evelyn. Maybe we'll all be talking about the net choice standard for disclosure requirements in the next uh, five years or so or whenever. <laughs> um, we're running short on time, but I wanted to come to Gautam just real quick. Um, easy question, Gautam. You know, do you see any version of transparency mandates that might be constitutional setting aside what's happening in Florida and Texas? What do you think about their constitutionality? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, this is my personal view. I'm, I'm going to admit that I haven't spent as much time thinking about this as I think some of the other panelists. But, you know, I think one of the challenges here in these cases that uh, I sometimes like to think about is like, what's motivating this concern in the first place? And some of the concerns I think are not sincere or some of them are politically motivated. Um, you know, I love, you know, don't you love to see a world in which uh, GOP controlled legislatures are passing laws that regulate private industry to this? This is a very different GOP than the one that I grew up with. But I do think that there certainly are concerns about the power of these companies and, and what that means for public discourse. And that's why I think some of the um, 
ambivalence might be coming from. And so transparency is, you know, who doesn't love transparency, right? Everyone loves to know what's going on and whether or not you can effectuate that, I think is another question. But I think this idea that transparency mandates are just occasionally constitutional um, without any kind of attention to what those transparency regulations might mean. And, and as Evelyn pointed out, the sort of burdensomeness or the difficulty in effectuating them, or maybe even the motivations. I know there's been some discussion as well about the legislatures in these cases, um, you know, doing, uh, may, may, may making statements that, that reveal some of the, the concerns that they have that may not be based in, um, you know, good faith government, uh, governance. I do think that there, it would be really unfortunate if the the net choice ruling said you know any transparency reporting uh, mandates are unconstitutional i think both for jurisprudential and also practical reasons i don't think the court's going to say that because i think that is a level of breadth that you probably couldn't get five people to vote for but you know i think we're all living in interesting times when it comes to this court so maybe i'll be eating my words in a few months we'll find out <laughs> Um, Harold, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, is there anything we can learn from the broadcast context here? Because there are certain requirements to make disclosure for, by broadcast and cable companies and others to the FCC, particularly around political candidates and elections. So in the transparency context, is there anything we can learn from that? And more generally with the 11th Circuit's analysis, um, do you think that they got it right in the way that they were talking about the way they talk, uh, the way we treat elections and political candidates in, in the law? Yeah, I mean, it's important to recognize that particularly around political candidates, which is not just uh, often general speech, but timely speech and goes to the core of uh, First Amendment uh, uh, concerns, um, that at least with regard to broadcasting and cable uh, and uh, DB and direct broadcast satellite, the, the electronic broadcast media, let's call them, we have a lot of regulation with regard to equal access by political candidates, uh, what we call the uh, the broadcast file or political file, um, which is a requirement to uh, um, to record uh, who is purchasing uh, ads uh, and uh, requirements that uh, uh, political candidates are allowed to purchase advertising. They get a special rate if they're uh, um, you know, qualified federal candidates. So we have a strong tradition here. Typically, what what's said is, well, you know, broadcast is always its own special category because of the scarcity doctrine, and you know, especially by people who don't like the scarcity doctrine. Uh, but the scarcity doctrine is not the only prong that supports these kinds of disclosures. Now, whether the specific laws that are at issue here would or should pass muster is a separate question. But I think the the 11th Circuit just kind of poo-pooing this idea that um, we traditionally have um, special regulation around disclosure requirements with regard to political candidates, regulation about access by political uh, uh, candidates, restrictions on the ability of uh, you know uh, broadcasters who are traditionally not common carriers and who have uh, um, you know access to uh, uh, you know get to generally pick and choose. Who I think that that the court chose to ignore all of that, and uh, I think that. Uh, um, there are some important elements here that uh, um, that uh, you know we need to look at and be careful about in our uh, analysis. Uh, I also think that you know, frankly, the Eleventh Circuit had the worst rationale on looking at at refusing to look at the very clear statements that Chris was talking about that this was basically retaliation and had nothing whatsoever to do with real disclosure, um, which was the district court had relied on a uh, case that uh, doesn't get talked about much, but it's one of my favorite cases, which is the Church of the Lukimi Babalu IA versus the city of Hialeah, um, where you had a uh, town that uh, didn't like the fact that you had a, a religious group that did animal sacrifice, so they passed these facially neutral laws about slaughtering animals only in particular locations, and the Supreme Court didn't have any trouble saying, look, we can tell from reading the city council records and looking at all this that that was an obvious sham, and that what was really going on here was you didn't like their religious practices, and so this is a violation. The 11th Circuit, the district court relied on that and brought in all of this evidence of 
uh, um, you know, legislative intent. Uh, the Eleventh Circuit basically said, well, that was a religious free exercise case, and this is a free, and this is a First Amendment free expression case, so not relevant. And I'm like. Huh? Um, you know, we have not traditionally made that distinction in First Amendment law. Um, and uh, again, I think that uh, uh, I don't know that the Supreme Court will look at this, but um, as was mentioned in the last panel, I think the court may look for some easier off ramps for some of these tougher questions. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, going to the heart of the legisl the very clear legislative intent here. Um, you know, uh, where the court may just say, look, you know, without touching the question of, you know, kind of what transparency would or wouldn't be, this is obviously regulation of the content policy rather than a transparency around the content policy. And it, you know, was clearly enacted as a an effort to try to circumvent the First Amendment. Um, and we don't have any problem looking at that uh, motivation where it's that obvious here. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we, we only have a few minutes left. I do want to take a question from the audience. Um, I'm going to take one and maybe modify it a little bit. Um, somebody has asked what the impact might be on the information ecosystem if Texas and Florida prevail, and also if the Supreme Court narrows Section 230C1. And of course, we're talking about the net choice cases, but we all know that the Supreme Court has already granted cert um, in Gonzalez and Tomna, and, and Gonzalez will be considering uh, Section 230 for the first time. So I guess um, I, I'll, I'll ask Evelyn, um, since we've only got a few minutes left, is there a way to think about these cases in tandem? Are there risks that the justices might be thinking about them wrong? Is they're thinking about them at the same time? Is there a way to harmonize them together? Yeah, uh, definite risks. And it is in some sense lucky, hopefully, potentially, that the, these have bubbled up to the court at a similar kind of time, because hopefully that forces the court to think about how on earth to reconcile um, these issues. For audience members that haven't necessarily been following the other panels or as closely, the the, the issue in Gonzalez and Tumna is, you know, to oversimplify the potentially greatly expanding platform liability for terrorist content on their services. Now, trying to combine that expanded liability with, for example, the Texas provision saying you can't take, you can't discriminate based on viewpoint is tough. Um, and so, you know, Daphne Keller uh, on a podcast to quote her again with, with me, uh, which is a good overview of the cases, if anyone's interested, uh, likened it to a three-dimensional wooden puzzle where you try and jam the pieces together into a coherent shape and you just can't, um, which I think gives a great image of like Justice Th Thomas trying to, trying to struggle with this. Uh, I think it really, the, the reason why it's tricky is it really does depend on the grounds and, and the ways in which uh, the court decides. And I think there are ways in which some of this could be reconciled if Gonzalez is defined really, so is confined really narrowly to a certain kind of amplification, or potentially, you know, if we see uh, in net choice, the Texas provisions uh, struck down, but um, the, the political candidate provisions much more narrowly sort of upheld in certain contexts, you might be able to find a way that doesn't completely, you know, destroy the way that these might coherently fit together. But I think it's like incredibly tough. And do, is this, is this something that I want, you know, Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, uh, those kinds of people thinking about these incredibly technically difficult questions um, and incredibly fast moving. I don't know if the, you know, the courts are the best way to be thinking about these questions, um, but uh, but that's where we are. So, um, yeah, let, let, you know, I look forward to waiting to see how the puzzle turns out. I think we all do look forward um, with some trepidation, maybe. <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists, Evelyn, Harold, Chris, and Gautam. Thank you so much for a really interesting discussion. We are going to take a five-minute break, and so we will be back at 1.20 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be having a panel this afternoon um, about the court's first look at Section 230 and a deep dive into Gonzalez v. Google and Twitter v. Tomna. So I hope you'll join us again at 1.20 p.m. Eastern time in about five minutes. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our second panel of the day. The court's first look at Section 230, a deep dive on Gonzalez versus Google and Twitter versus Tomney. For this panel, we are privileged to be joined by a stellar group of speakers who collectively have, I'm going to say this even if it are some decades of experience concerning Section 230, free speech, and related issues. Uh, David Brody is the managing attorney of the Digital Justice Initiative at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which he launched in 2019. He focuses on issues at the intersection of technology and racial justice, including consumer privacy, algorithmic bias, content moderation, and free speech. Eric Goldman is a professor of law at Santa Clara University of Law in Silicon Valley, as well as the co-director of the High Tech Law Institute. He's a well-known scholar, writer, and thought leader, specifically around Section 230 and content moderation. His technology and marketing law blog is a must-use resource for keeping up with developments in law in this area. Jennifer Granick is the Surveillance and Cybersecurity Council with the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. She litigates, speaks, and writes about privacy, security, and constitutional rights. Prior to her time at the ACLU, Jennifer, among other things, was one of the founders of the Stanford Law School's Center for Internet and Society. Ambika Kumar is a partner and co-chair of the media law practice at Davis Wright Tremaine. She has extensive experience defending some of the world's leading media and technology companies in cases involving Section 230, as well as other technology and media law issues. Thanks so much to the speakers for joining us today. Um, just to do a quick level set for the audience, the two cases we'll be discussing today both arise under the Anti-Terrorism Act, or ATA. In each case, families of the victims of terror terrorist acts committed by ISIS are suing online platforms, claiming that they should be civilly liable for aiding and abetting the terrorist acts. In the Gonzalez case, the plaintiffs claim that Google aided ISIS's recruiting efforts by recommending ISIS videos through operation of its recommendation algorithms. And the question before the court is whether such targeted recommendations fall within the scope of immunity provided by Section 230. In Tomne, the plaintiffs alleged that Twitter was generally aware that ISIS was using its platform for recruiting and other activities and failed to take significant, sufficient actions to block such use. The court below did not address Section 230 in this case, and so the question presented to the court is whether these types of allegations are sufficient to state a claim against an online platform for aiding and abetting liability under the ATA. With that very brief summary, let me bring in the panelists. And let's start really by picking up where, where the last panel left off, which was discussing the net choice cases. If the court grants cert there and decides that content moderation is generally a form of editorial discretion protected by the First Amendment, does it really matter what the court does with Section 230 in Gonzalez, or does the First Amendment provide sufficient protection? Eric, I know you've written about the relationship between Section 230 and the First Amendment. What's your view, your view on that? Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for including me in this event and for putting it together. I'm delighted to be here. Um, the question that you're asking, it really relates to the intersection between Section 230 and the First Amendment. If we were to assume that the First Amendment covers content moderation, then in theory, we wouldn't need Section 230 because we already have this non-amendable uh, or you know, functionally non-amendable protections for all of the things that Section 230 is supposed to do. But there's a bunch of things that Section 230 does that uh, enhance or turbocharge the substantive protections that the Constitution provides. Let's start with the, the most basic, um, that Section 230 covers more cleanly things that might be in doubt under the First Amendment. And so, for example, um, commercial speech has got a tortured constitutional jurisprudence. We don't really know what the next commercial speech case is going to say. Section 230 applies to speech uh, on moderation decisions, regardless of whether or not they're considered to be editorial, political, or commercial. It treats them all the same. So it smooths out some of the questions that we might ha have under the Constitution and takes them off the table. They, it gives a statutory basis for the courts to decide them. And because of the fact that uh, it's a statute that's being interpreted, not the Constitution, courts generally feel empowered to make decisions on motions to dismiss. They don't need to wait to summary judgment or for a trial in order to feel like they have enough evidence um, or uh, factual allegations to resolve the matter at hand. And it makes a huge difference to content moderation decisions if they can be defended on a motion to dismiss versus summary judgment and trial. 
the costs and managerial attention required to reach summary judgment or a trial is so much greater than um, uh, winning on a motion to dismiss. So by giving the courts the basis to resolve these cases on a motion to dismiss, it reduces the cost of uh, defense. It, it discourages plaintiffs from bringing the case just to uh, impose those costs onto defendants. And as a result, it empowers defendants to feel like they can actually make that choice without uh, the fear that they're going to be second guessed in court. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is that uh, uh, courts um, generally follow a principle of constitutional avoidance. Um, they know when they resolve matters on constitutional bases that they're making it so the legislature can't do a thing. They're handcuffed at that point once the constitutional decision has been made. Section 230 gives the courts a way to resolve these matters without touching the Constitution, without turning every case into a First Amendment battle royale that has dramatic stakes that the court itself is not in the best position to resolve. So in a sense, Section 230 gives the courts a way to reach the outcome they might have reached on the First Amendment, but to do so with confidence that they're not making decisions that could never be changed in the future. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, ask the other panelists if they want to weigh in on that, or more generally, the relationship that they see between the Gonzalez and Twitter cases on the one hand and the net choice cases on the other. You know, are there dangers or is it good that they're, the courts is going to likely be considering these at around the same time? Well, I, I would say I think it's an interesting situation to find what us ourselves in, because on the one hand, you have these cases that say you can't take content down. Um, the net choice cases. And on the other hand, you have the uh, the Gonzalez and Tamna cases, which say you have to take content down. And so, you know, with the both of these principles cannot be true at the same time. So in some ways, uh, perhaps the fact that these issues are arising and are potentially before the court at the same time is beneficial because it really points out the um, damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of nature of of uh, the demands on speech intermediaries right now. Great. Well, Jennifer, let me stick with you and ask, as we scope out, what what what's at stake here in terms of the cases? What does the internet look like post-June if, for example, Google and Twitter lose? Yeah, I mean, I think these are pretty apocalyptic cases and that there's a chance that after these rulings come down, um, you know, in a short while, the Internet will not look anything like the Internet that we know today. I um, mean, I think that's because the um, let's say that the court rules, as the plaintiff has suggested here, that platforms have a binary choice of leaving information up or taking it down, but they cannot promote or target or demote or recommend it. That holding makes no sense in light of the reality of what services are provided. I mean, just think about a search engine. A search engine is there to provide people with the information that they think is most relevant. It inherently involves promoting some speech over others. There's no other way to do it. Um, a homepage is the same thing. Some things appear on the homepage and some things don't. Our eyes and our screens can't see all the internet at the same time. So there has to be some kind of discrimination um, that happens there. Um, and I think this, you know, this discrimination is it goes beyond the need for platforms to show this goes beyond just the question of like, will I be able to see cat videos or those sorts of things? Um, you know, it is a major benefit. Discoverability is a major benefit that service providers give to users. Um, and discoverability helps us find the things that we're interested in and, you know, connect with the people who are important to us. You know, movements start small. So think about the Me Too movement. I mean, if there were, you know, basically just like a chronological order um, on Twitter, let's say, these important messages could be buried in the feed and people don't see them. But when messages are available or promoted to people who are interested, you know, when search engines aren't just random or something like that, this is, you know, you get information, you get associations before interested people, those connections can snowball and those connections have an effect, a can have a political effect. It's not like victims are just crying out into a void and there's nobody there to see. Um, I've also seen, you know, in terms of I don't know what what um, the um, proponents of a leave down, take up binary rule think that, you know, things on the Internet will look like. But a chronology is can be very 
um, you know, interfere with the ability of users to get any value out of these services. And, um, you know, if you look at just whatever, whoever speaks first, that person could have the most low value speech while the comments or um, questions that are, you know, lower down in the thread, but are more important and more valuable. And providers need to rank those, whether it's with upvotes on Reddit or with an assessment by the provider of what people of what people want to see. And this doesn't just help the listeners, doesn't just help, you know, sort of the public users who are just checking in on Facebook or Twitter or Reddit. Um, it helps speakers, it helps artists, it helps um, political speakers, um, it helps the um people who have a message, who've taken time to craft it, to put it before an interested public. Um, and, you know, I think it's a little mystifying why you would think that that um, value changes if it is specific to particular people. Because if you're trying as a platform to make a guess about what everybody might like, um, and you don't have the option to show different things to different people, or to downrank for certain people things that they might not be interested in or show them something else, you have this terrible chilling effect because I need to curate my platform in a way that is the most anodyne and the most innocuous for the most users. And I'm put in a situation where if I think something will turn off one user, then I'm either in the position of, you know, basically giving them a bad experience or taking the content offline entirely. And given that choice, I think overall, these kind of rules would um, incentivize platforms to take down far more um, lawful speech that could be very interesting and very important, albeit to a minority of users. David, I'll, David, I'll ask you to weigh in here. You know, your focus obviously is sort of some of the civil rights implications of Section 230. I mean, from your standpoint, what's at stake from a civil rights perspective? Has 230 been a net positive, net negative? What, 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 what's at stake from your perspective? Sure. Uh, you know, from, from a civil rights perspective, uh, Section 230 is a double-edged sword. Uh, so, you know, to, to to build on what what Jennifer was saying, without Section 230, we wouldn't have the internet as we know it today. However, on the other hand, without Section 230, we wouldn't have the internet as we know it today. Um, you know, but kidding aside, like Section 230 uh, has been instrumental in allowing racial justice movements and other sorts of social activist movements to build support online. Uh, Black Lives Matter grew out of uh, a series of, of posts and has hashtags on social media. And it grew into this massive international movement. Uh, Darnella Frazier, the, the young black woman who filmed the murder of George Floyd, she said, if it weren't for my video, the world wouldn't have known the truth. If it wasn't for Section 230, her video probably would not have been able to be widely disseminated and go viral. Uh, and so, you know, there is an important role that Section 230 plays in allowing this type of content to develop. It's also really important for, for uh, influencers and creators of color who are trying to get around traditional media gatekeeping uh, and for uh, other types of, of niche voices to, to reach others like themselves and, and build businesses without for, for those who don't have access to, to capital and other types of things. However, uh, all these things also have led to this extreme explosion of, of white supremacy and hate and harassment online. 25% of American adults report that they have experienced physical threats, stalking, sexual harassment, or sustained harassment online. Half of Black and Hispanic adults say that when they were targeted for online harassment, it was because of their race or ethnicity. 33% of adult women under 35 report being sexually harassed online. 70% of gay, lesbian, and bisexual adults have encountered online harassment, and half of those people have been targeted for severe abuse. And over the last roughly year or so, uh, extreme online harassment targeting Asian Americans has went up 50% year over year. In addition, what we also see is 
that if there is not appropriate limits on what Section 230 immunizes, you can get into this problem where uh, platforms can be immunized when they are the, the cause of discrimination. And so what we've seen, for example, is online advertising systems for housing, employment, credit, various sorts of opportunities that they might be benign content, a housing ad that's not discriminatorily targeted, uh, that, that is perfectly legal and fine. And then the algorithm on the platform steers it in a discriminatory manner. So it disproportionately goes to white users or male users. There's, various, there, there's lots of research showing that employment advertisements for various types of jobs are steered to men or women, depending on what the job is. And so in those types of situations, we need to make sure that, you know, we need to have a balanced approach to Section 230. It needs to, to apply to, uh, to, con to, to publishing. And if a platform is engaged in publishing, it needs to apply only so long as the platform is not materially contributing to the illegality. So, you know, uh, to answer one of the, the questions I saw in the chat there, like what is a positive development for 230 jurisprudence coming out of, of Gonzales? You know, one of the things that that we are following closely and paying close attention to is, does the Supreme Court ratify or discard the neutral tools test that was first articulated in roommates? Uh, we think the court, and, and we're actually about to file our amicus brief, I keep refreshing the docket to see if it's posted yet. It'll probably post while we're talking here. Um, we think the court should discard the neutral tools test because it has no basis in the statutory text. And, and what the court should be focused on in terms of determining whether or not a material contribution has occurred is uh, what uh, the Sixth Circuit said in Jones versus Dirty World Entertainment, which is, is the platform responsible for what makes the displayed content allegedly unlawful? It's, it's, it's about responsibility for the illegality. And, and so, you know, in terms of ensuring that we strike the right balance for allowing free speech and, and, and ensuring that marginalized voices aren't censored, while at the same time, not giving these platforms a get out of jail free card, as the Ninth Circuit said in, in internet brands, um, you know, we have to make sure that, that, that that publisher test and material contribution test are properly calibrated. Great. Thanks, Dave. I want to dig more into that line drawing I issue uh, in, in a minute. But uh, Ambik, I wanted to bring you in the conversation both to talk, you know, it, anything you wanted to add in terms of what's at stake, but also to bring us to the Gonzalez case in particular and to uh, talk about, uh, you know, from your perspective as a litigator, what do you see as the range of possible outcomes here in the case that the Supreme Court might reach so that we can sort of have in mind sort of what the scope of outcomes here is? Sure. Well, I, I think <clears throat> One interesting thing to start with is the question that's actually presented in Gonzalez, which I pasted in the question and answer <clears throat> um, to, in response to someone's question, which is, does Section 230C1 immunize interactive computer services when they make targeted recommendations of information provided by another information content provider, or only limit the liability of interactive computer services when they engage in traditional editorial functions, parentheses, such as deciding whether to display or withdraw with regard to such information. Now that question um, is puzzling to me because uh, I'm not sure I see the distinction between targeted recommendations and traditional editorial functions, at least in, in most circumstances. Um, so it will be interesting to see what the court does with that. In terms of the range of options, you know, the best case scenario for Section 230 um, is affirming the court's decision below. Um, I do think that is a net benefit um, because there are courts that are struggling and sometimes uh, outliers in their hostility to Section 230 and making bad decisions. Um, you know, it's possible that the court will reverse uh, the decision, but on narrow grounds. I, I'm honestly not sure what those grounds would be, but I think the biggest risk um, is that the decision will stray from the main issue, 
um, and make some findings that are not helpful. Um, it's been a long, you know, it's been 26 years of Section 230 without Supreme Court interpretation. Um, the courts have very broadly construed the immunity, um, including on the on the part, part of Section 230 about development of content, which David just mentioned, um, as well as what it means to act as a publisher or speaker. Um, I think there are a variety of ways in which a court could look at the text and come to a different conclusion than the vast majority of courts have so far. Um, but in doing so, if, if the court did that, it would be you know, a startling development for the internet as a whole. I think most likely we're gonna get a decision that is confusing, um, maybe in different parts by different justices um, where the guidance just isn't clear, um, which would be too bad because, and I can't remember if Eric said this, but the first amendment law is kind of all over the place. Um, and it is it is not as clean. I know he did say that. It's not as clean as section 230. So if section 230 becomes muddled too, um, that itself becomes uh, a problem for um, sort of the diversity and volume of speech on the internet. Yeah, no. if I can just, if I can just um, add I, some, oh, or, I'm sorry, Samir. I was just going to add ahead. something to that. Thank you. I was just going to add something to that, you know, in terms of what the kind of gatekeeping function of the platforms is and, you know, what, mm -hmm. what confusion as to legal standards can mean. And I think mm -hmm. we're seeing that in the Tamna case where you have these um, ISIS recruitment videos, um, <laughs> that platform, that, uh, you know, the court has held that Twitter is responsible for. Um, and it is, you know, based on a very attenuated, you know, level of connection and, and you know, without knowledge or specific information about um, the particular attack, attack in which the plaintiff's loved ones died. Um, but it really creates this, this real chilling effect when there's uncertainty, when there's legal uncertainty. And I think that is the um, intention of CDA 230 is to remove that legal uncertainty. Um, and, and part of that removal of legal uncertainty actually is for the purpose of addressing hate speech. Um, and I think we all know that, you know, content moderation tools are inexact and they will always, you know, make mistakes. But one of the things I think it's important to note is that as gatekeepers, platforms are both far more generous than traditional media was, um, you know, partially because there's just much more real estate on the internet than there is in the pages of the New York Times, um, and partially because there are there are the, you know this diverse audience where platforms can see you know people are interested in this particular content, but at the same time as gatekeepers they have an immense amount of power. The large ones, large platforms have an immense immense amount of power. And I think it's important to note that for all the major platforms, um, hate speech, harassment, terrorist content, and a host of other disfavored types of information are contrary to terms of service and the platforms intend to take them down. Um, they may be doing that in, you know, uh, they are doing it inaccurately, but the major platforms are not designed in any way to be cesspools, basically. Well, I guess what I'm saying is there doesn't need to be for the major platforms that most people are on. Um, they are already taking this information down because of market incentives, not because of legal obligations. I mean, Elon Musk may beg to differ. <laughs> Eric, I, I want to bring you back into the conversation um, to maybe in part to respond to what David was saying earlier. I want to get into the line drawing question. And David was suggesting that the line to be drawn here for when providers might be potentially liable is when they're responsible for the illegality, not so much in the neutral tools context, like in the roommate's case, but that they've done something like steering uh, neutral ads only to a particular gender or race or something like that. What's your reaction to that idea of that kind of line drawing between uh, around Section 230? Ultimately, it's unavoidable, but the Supreme Court is uh, it, almost certainly going to botch it um, because of the fact that it requires them to consider a wide range of use cases that they are just not briefed on. They're not going to be told about. The people who are going to be affected may not even be appearing by amici. Um, so this idea, I think, between 
um, I, I mean, step back. Section 230 contemplates a world where we can cleanly divide between first party content and actions and third party content and actions. And Section 230 says if it's first party, it doesn't apply. If it's third party content or actions, then Section 230 can apply. Um, and when you draw it on a whiteboard, that all sounds pretty elegant. But this idea between first and third party content um, really collapses in so many circumstances, especially when plaintiffs are putting pressure on that very question. What they keep trying to show is that it's really third-party content, but something that the service did has now converted it back into first-party content. So any line drawing that's done to try and cleave between first-party and third-party is going to have errors of omission and commission. There's no doubt that that can never be drawn in a way that's going to be uh, precise. Um, but encouraging that line drawing by the Supreme Court in this case almost certainly is going to exacerbate the problem because of all the use cases they'll not even be able to contemplate. So I'm really worried about that very line drawing. The question presented invites that kind of uh, uh, inquiry. And you know, you can run your mind through a thousand hypotheticals about where this could go wrong. Uh, most of those have no bearing on reality. And yet that's exactly what could drive the outcome. Ambika, curious about your perspective, having litigated a lot of these cases. Uh, well, I, I agree with pretty much everything Eric just said. Um, the problem is drawing lines. There is never going to be a perfect line drawing that you can do. And so, you know, if there are lines drawn, the question is, what's the least bad line? And um, I definitely don't trust uh, the Supreme Court to make a wise decision on that. Um, I think you know, we have seen a lot of hostility, or I see a lot of this hostility um, to Section 230 in the cases that I've litigated. Um, and it's become an increasing focus of, in terms of defending cases. Um, you know, where do, do we argue Section 230? Do we put it at the bottom? Do we, you know, and the like. And so, um, you know, definitely this the Gonzalez decision has the possibility of radically changing that you know, those strategy decisions um, for the better or for the worse. Jennifer, I know the ACLU has struggled with the same question of how do you draw the line in a way that both promotes free speech, but also deals with some of the potential discrimination issues. What, what What's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, the way that we have looked at this is like, uh, you know, sort of along the lines of, of um, what David has said about, you know, uh, there being a a possibility of, um, of of illegal discrimination, which denies in, uh, vulnerable communities and members of our society of opportunities that are critical in the areas of education, um, housing, employment, credit, and those sorts of things. Um, but we see, I, I don't think that um, addressing that serious problem is in conflict with uh, CDA 230 protections because the discrimination, the problematic online discrimination that happens with targeting based on race or gender or other protected characteristics is a um, decision by the platform that is itself illegal under the anti-discrimination laws. You can plead a cause of action against the platforms for that illegal discrimination without reference to the underlying content in the ad. So it's not holding the platform liable for the third party content, it's holding the platform liable for its own independent illegal targeting decisions. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Eric that you know all line drawing is difficult and but I think that that is a um you know a pretty clear and policeable line. Um, that does not have no, nothing about enforcing those kinds of uh, anti-discrimination um, uh, principles need interfere with the platform's ability um, or need chill the platform's ability to carry um, third party content, whether ads or otherwise. David, you had begun this discussion, so I want to return to you and sort of see if you have anything you wanted to add on this question. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I totally agree with, with what, what Jennifer said. I mean, I think one thing that we want to keep perspective on is when we're talking about Section 230, it's really easy to stay myopically focused on social media. But it, it there's a lot of impacts beyond that as well. And, and we have to keep in mind how this could, how 
other types of platforms use third party content and not all uses of third party content involve publishing. So that's like if, if we're thinking about like how do, when would Section 230 not apply in a discrimination context? The first question is, like, is there actually publishing happening here? And so, you know, for example, if there's an algorithm that is uh, deciding whether or not to approve someone for a mortgage or what interest rate they should get or, or which applicants uh, get interviews for a job or which images match a facial recognition search query, none of those things involve publishing, but they do probably in many instances involve third party content. And so it's important to recognize that Section 230 does not necessarily apply in those types of decisions. And then second, even if there is publishing happening, you know, like Jennifer was saying, did the is the platform responsible for for what is is the illegal act? You know, did you know did the platform steer an advertisement based on a protected characteristic, even if the the advertisement itself was not illegal? Or maybe the advertisement is illegal, but the platform also did something further illegal with it. That is also something that, that could, could, could amount to material contribution. We have a case uh, involving voter intimidation where um, uh, some the defendants sent robocalls targeted to black neighborhoods to try to dissuade people from voting. And in that case, the service provider uh, made, moved under, uh, tried to invoke Section 230 to uh, to dismiss the case, the claims against them, and the the court said, "Wait a minute, you know the allegation is that you, service provider, were in communication with these other defendants and were helping them pick the zip codes to target so that they could target black neighborhoods. That's material contribution." And so the, the invocation of Section 230 was denied there. These are the types of things where, um, you know, it's all case by case. It's all fact specific. Um, and it, you know, we can't paint with a broad brush one direction or the other. There needs to be a really nuanced test. And we have to be careful, very, very careful about, you know, not just saying that, you know, here's some broad swath of things that can happen with neutral tools or, or various other types of systems that platforms are using, and it should all be immune for the good of the internet, uh, because that's a very dangerous road to go down in terms of, of equal opportunity uh, online. So Eric, I, wanna, I know you expressed nervousness about the Supreme Court even delving into this because it's not fully briefed, uh, understand that. Um, but I'm curious, sort of substantively, sort of your reaction to some of these ideas um, about ways to carve out 230 if the court does decide to go down this road. Uh, yeah, I, I can't stress enough that uh, everything we've discussed about discrimination based on protected classifications has nothing to do with the Gonzalez case. And if the court's opining upon it, it's free uh, lancing in areas where it hasn't been properly briefed and only bad things are likely to happen from that circumstance. So I am praying that the court chooses not to go there um, and they'll do whatever they want. Um, in terms of the substance line, uh, we, we go back to what we learned from the roommates.com case back in 2008 that articulated this notion that there were a couple of ways in which Section 230 would step back um, when uh, the uh, service uh, 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 desi was designed to require the input of legal content um, or were materially contributed to the illegality. Um, and that standard, uh, as I think, as actually applied led to relatively light pernicious outcomes. Um, it, you know, I, I can't remember who was earlier saying we just have to pick among the, the least best or the, you know, uh, least harmful um, uh, option. Um, uh, the, the standard has, I think, um, helped distinguish between the idea that third party content isn't, uh, uh, cannot be the base liability, but if in fact, there's would not have been illegality, but for what the service did that wasn't just publishing or disseminating third party content, then liability could attach. Um, and so stated that way, I think uh, I'm OK with that. Uh, that to me is one way and a tested way of distinguishing between first party and third party content. Um, I do think that we have to be careful about 
uh, than trying to figure out if this scenario is or is not covered by that standard. Um, and I'll go back to the uh, robocall situation that um, uh, David mentioned. Um, I hear him. Um, and yet I will point out uh, that really what the, the allegations are is that the service recommended how to get the content in front of the, the a more targeted audience. And to me, that starts to look a lot like all the things that we are worried that might go wrong in the Gonzalez case. So um, that's where when we start looking at how it's applied, uh, this, this theoretical standard, how it's applied, it creates opportunities for courts to do really goofy things. And that then becomes the basis on which the next plaintiff will try and stretch it a little bit further. Um, so is the material contribution standard an inherent problem? It is a way of solving the distinction between first party and third party content. But in the hands of courts who don't understand it or who want to weaponize it, it actually is a tool that has led to pernicious outcomes. I mean, I think to, to your point, Eric, and I think it's a it's a important question is, you know, one of the things that's hanging over all of these cases, and that's part of why so many people um, are kind of turning against Section 230 is this idea that we have these vulnerable people um, in the uh, Gonzalez and in the Tamne case of people who are um, predispositioned to be interested in and potentially join ISIS. And you have this um, sort of, you know, targeted decision to reach these particular vulnerable people and thereby like take somebody who otherwise didn't know they wanted to join ISIS and convert them into, you know, into a jihadist. And I think that part of, you know, what is overhanging this case and people who've been dealing with 230 a lot is the idea that, you know, you have on the one hand, um, this claim that like vulnerable people are being radicalized. And the other hand, you have this claim that political movements are being connected and, uh, and people are able to associate and make a difference. Um, and I think that there is a concern that the court will, um, you know, sort of in answering the one that is, you know, sort of in current um, conversation, forget about all the others that have happened over the past 26 years. And that is why, you know, I think this judicial line drawing is difficult. I think it's not in the statute. If there's something, you know, that is going to be changed, it should be, it's better for it to be through a broader democratic process than it is for just these justices without facts before them to make a decision. Um, and I just note that so far, Congress has not chosen to, to amend CDA 230. Um, but I think it's that issue of like vulnerability that's really hanging over this conversation and it's worthwhile to name it. Uh, Samir, if I can just chime in. I, I, I think it's an interesting way of framing it, Jennifer, this notion of vulnerability, because in the end, publishers try to persuade their audience. That's like a basic no relationship between the publisher and the people who consume their content. Um, so treating the consumers of content as being vulnerable, I think masks some really heterogeneous interactions that are taking place there. Um, because then people will say, but uh, advertisers are preying on vulnerable consumers. And that's true sometimes. And other times, advertising is actually a solution to a marketplace problem. And so um, by using the term vulnerable, I just want to acknowledge that you're, you're framing it in a way that actually masks, I think, the full range of scenarios. I agree with you. I, I'm sort of trying to, to, to state a, a case. I think there's a huge amount of paternalism in there. Um, and I think we seeing that paternalism in the net choice cases where, you know, there's this effort to say, like, here's what's good for you. Um, this is what you should be listening to. And this is what you shouldn't be listening to. And we're seeing that iteration in like the Stop Woke Act cases and the stuff that's bubbling up from the states that are like anti-drag and the new efforts to declare certain books as obscene and that sort of thing. I mean, we know information is powerful. Um, but the First Amendment principles allocated to us, the people, to absorb that information and do what it with it what we will, so long as our actions aren't aren't illegal. Um, but I think we're seeing this real effort to go after the intermediaries as a choke point, um, you know, where uh, where there's this paternalistic effort to delete some messages and feed other messages to the public. Just building on that a little bit. You know, I think we also have to to really keep in mind here that like the internet's not coded on a blank slate. We have 50, 60 years worth of civil rights laws that have governed uh, without too many problems uh, the ways in which certain types of, of actions or communications 
are unlawful because of the, the very type of balancing that that we want Congress to do, saying, here's where we're going to draw the line in terms of this type of discrimination is unlawful. This type of restriction on commercial activity is lawful because it's for the greater good of ensuring equal opportunity. And you know, when Congress passed Section 230 in 1996, no one was thinking about how the law would affect enforcement of these long-standing bedrock civil rights laws. And I'm pretty sure no one would have said, oh, yes, we want to, to, to overwrite all of this. So we have to find a way for these things to, to coexist and, and work together. Um, and, you know, if we end up in a situation where it is effectively impossible to enforce laws prohibiting voter intimidation or employment discrimination or housing discrimination, credit discrimination, public accommodation uh, uh, interference, things like that, that's going to, to harm speech in a completely different way too, which is uh, when people get silenced online because they're harassed, because they're discriminated against, that's a speech restriction too. We have a risk of a heckler's veto here if you you know if there, it's a completely unregulated space, and so you know I do think there 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 is a, a difficult balance that has to be struck here to ensure that um, the law goes as far as it is intended to go and not farther. So I want to pick up on a couple of suggestions that are in the Q&A about this line drawing issue. One is the question, and Ambika, you hinted at this when you were talking about the question presented earlier, of whether uh, there's a meaningful line to be drawn between, for example, targeted advertisements that are or targeted content that are using, you know, content about a user in order to determine you know, whether someone's vulnerable to recruitment by ISIS, for example, and whether there's some distinction to be drawn between targeted and non-targeted content. And then someone else asks uh, a similar question about amplification, whether um, there, there's something to be said that when a service provider amplifies content, it then becomes um, or contributes to the illegality. So you can imagine in the terrorist content context that we're dealing with here, that, you know, suppose someone from ISIS posts a fundraising uh, email or a, a fundraising post that doesn't get seen by anybody and therefore is ineffective. But on the other hand, the platform amplifies it and shows it to, you know, thousands of people. And as a result, it actually becomes really effective and raises a lot of money for ISIS. Is there some difference there? Is there some responsibility such that we should be drawing lines in the case of that kind of amplification or that kind of specific targeting? I'll throw it open for any of you to respond. Yeah, I think that's it's really dangerous because it depends on you know what content you think is harmful, right? And so um, you know there are lots of good things that come from targeted recommendations, um, you know, both in terms of convenience of consumers, but also, you know, resources for people who need them. Um, what we're talking about is a world where, you know, potentially a world where there are no targeted recommendations, meaning whatever you see, I mean, that's the way it used to be, like on Facebook, for example, I used to just see a feed, it was not relevant necessarily to me, and that experience has improved over time. But, you know, Jennifer mentioned some issues earlier that, you know, we, where we wouldn't really want, um, you know, the government interfering. For example, suppose someone is looking for abortion services, but, you know, particular state, you know, doesn't want that information conveyed. That's a real problem. And so um, that's why it is, it's, it is hard to envision a, a line drawn by the government that could possibly be acceptable to all of us. And building on that, I mean, I think that's why this is why, like, we at least think that an uh, appropriate way of, to look at this and interpret this is is focusing on the responsibility question. Like, like as as the Jones Court said, who is responsible for the illegality of the content? If there's content that is illegal, it's defamatory or whatever it is. And the platform is amplifying it, targeting it, do it, re recommending it, whatever. The platform's not responsible for the illegality. And, and that's when Section 230 is supposed to apply. But if the content is, is, is not illegal and it is the platform's actions that convert it into unlawful conduct, 
that is when 230 is not supposed to apply. If I could just add a couple of uh, quick points. First of all, we do know that the market desperately wants recommended content or algorithmically filtered content and not content that's presented under something like a reverse chronological order. And something like Twitter has been a good example about that. Very few users opt into the reverse chronological presentation. Almost all the users use the algorithmic feed because it's a better solution for them. I personally actually use the reverse chronological ordering on Twitter, but I also follow very few people and that's because otherwise it becomes unmanageable. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that to say that there's some kind of notion of untargeted content presentation, I think is, is fundamentally misguided. Um, reverse chronological order is a targeting of content. It just pri prioritizes pr recency over all other considerations. And that's not a very helpful factor in most circumstances. Recency is really not a good proxy for any content quality or relevance. Um, so uh, the, we have to abandon the notion that there's this thing called untargeted content presentation that we could pursue. The only thing that could be left is that we see an internet that's like Google Drive or Dropbox, where content gets uploaded and the uploader gets a URL that they then have to go and find the audience for. That wouldn't involve any uh, sort of uh, recommendations, amplification, or any other factors, but that wouldn't be very helpful. And to the point about things like the Me Too movement, it simply would not exist in that world. That, that world takes away the possibility of people actually getting the benefit of the algorithm to reach audiences that need to hear their message. David, let me ask you on the targeting question. I know you've been involved in uh, heavily involved in privacy legislation, for example, and curious to what degree you think that privacy is sort of a way in to deal with some of the concerns around targeted content, targeted advertising and the like. For sure. Yeah, no, I, I think that that is the right way to go. Um, you don't solve all the problems on the Internet by messing with Section 230. Um, you know, there's an active debate here about whether you solve any of them by messing with Section 230. Um, but uh, the way to address some of these issues is through privacy and data protection uh, legislation and regulation, like uh, the American Data Privacy and Protection Act that passed through the House Energy and Commerce Committee over the summer or through the FTC's commercial surveillance rulemaking. Uh, if, if you regulate how people's information is collected, used, and shared, uh, you can do some pretty significant things to, to change economic incentives that fuel the business models that produce things like hate and, and disinformation as negative externalities, as digital pollution, um, as side effects of the business model. Um, the, these a lot of the social media platforms are deliberately amplifying outrageous content because it, it maximizes user engagement. And so if you have uh, data privacy and protection regulations that, that change the economic incentives around why they want to maximize user engagement, they want to maximize user engagement to serve targeted advertisements. If you can change the business models and economic incentives there, you can, you can change uh, platform behavior, at least incidentally. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think that is um, a, a really productive way to go to to address some of these issues. I'm sorry, I do need to pipe up. I, I disagree with almost everything that David said. Um, I was <laughs> troubled by the rhetoric that he used. This notion about digital pollution, for example, or whatever, is, is really a pro-sensorial framing. Um, but I would broaden it to just say we absolutely need privacy legislation, but we should be very cautious about the risk of privacy legislation becoming backdoor censorship. And every time the question is framed, if we can't come in the front door with censorship and uh, either override the First Amendment or change Section 230, why don't we use the back door to do it via the privacy mechanism? If that's the goal, I object to it as well. That's not the goal. And if you have any provisions in ADPA that you think serve that goal, let us know and we'll take a look at that. But I'm pretty sure that's not what it does. Uh, I'll give you oh the God. example, however, something like the AADC in California has been framed as a privacy legislation, and yet it's very expressly a censorial law designed to address many of the same rhetorical moves that you made. Um, I saw you nodding your head as Eric was I was talking. just, I was going to say, I mean, you look at the AADC and it's, it's. Let me pause um, AADC for the audience. It's the age appropriate. Uh, age appropriate design, design code. code act, um, which California passed 
this year. Uh, a version of it exists in the UK, um, and the California version takes effect in 2024, but has a host of requirements that really are, it, it's a censorship law masquerading as a privacy law. Um, and I, I'm not sure about the ADPA, so I don't want to comment on it. Um, but it is a problem when you're saying, well, can we go about this problem a different way? Um, I.e., can we make it seem more palatable? And, you know, the reality is, like, politically speaking, that sometimes works. Companies don't want to come out and say, you know, they're opposed to legislation that purports to have a goal that is that might be noble. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm curious to hear from David sort of when he talks about changing the incentives, the economic incentives, you know, what does that look like? Does that mean online businesses aren't ad supported? Does it mean something else? What does it, what does it mean? No, so I want to be very clear here. I never said the age appropriate design code or whatever yeah, in California yeah. is a privacy law. That's not what we're talking about, right? Yeah, what right. I'm talking about in terms of privacy legislation is, is what Congress uh, passed that committee over the summer, right? We're talking about uh, a law that does no regulation of content and is uh, other than a provision that prohibits discriminatory use of data in the provision of goods and services uh, on the basis of protected characteristics, which for what it's worth is just an adaptation of civil rights laws that have been on the books since 1964 and previous. Um, what the what the ADPA does, what, what a good privacy law would do is it creates a data minimization regime that says that companies should only be collecting, using, and sharing information as reasonably necessary uh, to pursue a purpose that the consumer expects or other sort of important permissible purposes like data security, preventing fraud, things like that. And then you, you couple that with transparency and data security protections, individuals' rights to control and to, to access control, correct, delete their information, with appropriate limits, because those things all get very, very complicated in implementation, uh, and then appropriate and, and civil rights protections, auditing for for algorithmic uh, bias, and and uh, and then adequate enforcement through through federal, state uh, agencies or private suits or what have you. So let's be really clear about what privacy legislation does and what it does not do. It's not content regulation. It's regulation of the, the collection, use, and transfer of personal information. And the reason that that affects how these platforms operate is because it affects, just like how when Apple, you know, changed its privacy settings so that users could choose to opt out of, of Facebook and other platforms collecting their information, that hit Facebook's bottom line on, on targeted advertising. There is a, a robust literature about the, the pros and cons of targeted ads and, and other forms of, of, of other business models that, that might support these companies. But I think that, you know, when we're talking about regulating the way that data is collected and used in a pro-consumer, pro-privacy manner, uh, we want to ensure that there's some some floor of consumer protection, uh, like a data minimization regime. And then th what we're saying is that's going to have knock on benefits or other consequences for how platforms are structured and operate. Again, yeah, as David I, I, said, he didn't support uh, a reference to AADC as part of his remarks. But I will point out the AADC has the word privacy in it 46 times. Um, and that is reinforcing the point that I think Ambika and certainly I am making, which is th this redirection, hey, let's stop talking about content regulation, let's start talking about privacy, is often not a neutral switch. It's an, it's just another way of framing censorship. Okay. I'll let Eric have that. I mean, it's also, wait, wait, wait I, hold on, let me <laughs> respond, because it's also an unfair shift to call legitimate privacy bills a smoke screen for content moderation. That's the same rhetorical device in the other direction. You so may not be doing be it, and I respect about that. How we're characterizing different pieces of proposed legislation and regulation and not conflate things. Okay, so the point is that you may not be doing that, but there are many people who are doing that. And I hope that this audience takes away 
the message, there could be good privacy bills, but we should be cognizant of the fact that privacy is being weaponized as a pro-censorship tool by people who are not as uh, 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 adhering to your standards. I'll just, I'll just add that my project at the ACLU is the Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. And the reason why speech and technology are in the, both in the name and both in our project is exactly because of this effort, which is that, which we all know, which is that um, privacy can enhance speech, privacy can be, uh, um, uh, you know, an enemy of speech, and that it takes a lot of like nuanced and careful conversations and thought to try to get both of them together. So I just think uh, that's that that's what this conversation shows to to me is that they are um, friends sometimes and enemies other times, and we need to be very careful and have them like intimately related when we're trying to achieve both those values. Okay, that's a good note on which to end this piece of the discussion. So you're welcome. <laughs> um, we haven't. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about Gonzalez, and I, I do want to make sure that we spend a little time talking about Tomne. Um, Eric, do you want to just talk a little bit about what is what's the issue posed in Tomne? So the basic issue is whether or not uh, an internet service aids and abets terrorist activity by uh, publishing uh, 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 the content from terrorist organizations, um, and. It's a statutory question, which is why the case gets much less attention than Gonzalez, regardless of the resolution of the Anti-Terrorist Act, um, won't, uh, the resolution of the Anti-Terrorist Act won't necessarily affect uh, all the other use cases that Section 230 covers. So the Section 230 decision has ripple effects that could, uh, could upend the entire internet. Um, the statutory interpretation might in theory affect less. The problem is that Plaintiffs routinely allege that uh, uh, internet services are aiding and abetting the violation that the user is committing with their content that is at the core of the Section 230 question. So depending on how the Supreme Court frames the what constitutes aiding and abetting and to what extent that could act as an end run around this first party, third party distinction we spent almost all of our time talking about, it's possible that that case backdoor acts as a, a circumscription of Section 230 because of the ability of plaintiffs to then uh, invoke aiding and abetting as a workaround. So the stakes are also quite high on that, but it gets less attention because people are hoping that no matter what happens, that would only affect the Anti-Terrorism Act. I just I just would add to that that we are starting to see we see in some other areas where this idea of vicarious liability on the part of the platforms has led to broad censorship of speech. And we see that in the FOSTA context where um, CDA 230 is amended so that information related to um, sex trafficking and other types of crimes like that are is um you know, exempted from CDA 230. And what we saw is this broad censorship of websites that were beneficial to sex workers, even um, information that had to do with um, health and other um, kinds of important and valuable speech. So the idea that, you know, I mean, TAM is really important because the idea that aiding and abetting liability could fall on platforms really can have a broad impact on what's available, um, what's available to the public. And I think, and Ambika, I just wanted to say before, the, the idea that we got this far before mentioning abortion um, is kind of like a mistake on our part, because I think it's never been as obvious to people today as it should be with, you know, the, um, with the burgeoning abortion regulations and bans in so many states that access to you know, important, truthful, um, accurate information on the part of people who are using the internet, looking for help at, you know, what could be one of the worst times of their lives is really important. And the protections for platforms, particularly when, um, you know, it disseminating that information could be illegal, a crime under state law is really important. And CDA 230 provides immunity from that. And it's really critical at this point in time. So I just want to thank you for reminding us all about that um, about that current um, situation. Yeah, and I, I just I want to add on to to, to that as, as well because that that is our number one concern as well with with a potential restriction of Section two thirty. Uh, you know, Lawyers Committee is a racial justice organization. We are very concerned about access to reproductive health care by by uh, Black people, especially in the South, where these rights are under attack. 
Um, and we're also very concerned about access to, to healthcare and other ser services by LGBTQ individuals in states that are hostile to those rights. And, you know, this is the type of thing that Section 230 is meant to protect. And that's one of the things that we are, we are most concerned about. Great. Uh, Jennifer, if I could just ask you to elaborate on the, uh, in, in Tom Ney, on the sort of speech implications and the First Amendment implications, we just filed a brief with you talking about sort of some of the First Amendment implications, particularly around the knowledge standard that uh, that relates to aiding and abetting liability. Can you explain a little bit more about sort of some of the First Amendment uh, issues that are Im implicated here? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, there, you know, the there are even where some speech is not itself illegal there are crimes that can be committed through lawful speech um conspiracy is one where people get together and they agree to do a crime um and aiding and abetting can be another where i can say something to you like um you know the drugs are over there or uh you know something like that um, and so the distinction that the law has to make in order to ensure that information um, or, you know, conversations or musings or whatever are not criminalized when it has to do and when the crime is so dependent on speech, like aiding, embedding, conspiracy, solicitation, for example, are, is to require a high level of intention and knowledge as to the illegal activity. Um, and so, you know, there's whether, you know, mens rea or scienter or knowledge and intent, um, it's really important that where speech is involved, um, the criminal law has a very high standard for what kind of um, what kind of maliciousness or what kind of like criminal um, intention the, the person has. Otherwise, you have a situation where, um, you know, there is, uh, you, you know, where um, something like really what happened here um, in the Tamney case where you have uh, information which is lawful online. The platform doesn't want to carry this information but failed to, to take it down and treated it as the um, platform normally does in the regular course of its operation, nothing special or out of the ordinary. Um, somebody watched it. it. It helped ISIS and then uh, some ISIS um, uh, actors uh, committed a terrible crime. That is very attenuated from what Twitter did. And without a higher knowledge standard, you can see Twitter not just trying to take down this particular content, but being very aggressive um, and you know over uh, overcompensating by taking down anything that may have something to do with terrorism, just in case someone could point to it and say, this is the basis for your aiding and abetting liability. The, the better rule, and I think one that's pretty well founded in traditional um, criminal law, traditional federal criminal law, is that the aid and, aider and abetter has to know specifically about what it's doing that aids and abets and have um, know about the eventual specific crime and have some intention to bring those act, that activity about. Um, because otherwise, it's just <laughs> too dangerous to speak to um, lawful speech. And, and yet that's partly what's happening with sesta FOSTA, right? In some of these cases yes. um, where there it is, you know, conduct that I don't think we would want to penalize um, merely because a creative plaintiff can, you know, plead the allegations needed to constitute a violation of sex trafficking laws. Um, and that's the danger when you, when you change section 230, whether legislatively or judicially, um, you know, it will create, you have to be very careful what incentives you're going to create. Um, and so um, I think sesta is a is a lesson for us in that way. And back to your point about abortion, you know, you're going to have, we're going to see state laws that say um, it's unlawful to aid and abet access to abortion care by providing information about where to act, where like, right. you know, basically exactly. you can go to California and do this safely, or you can uh, order medication. Um, and self-manage your abortion. And, and, you know, this is going to, these are things that, you know, states may make illegal if they're not covered by 230, if they're considered aiding and abetting or something like that, then you have this chilling effect of, you know, really important information. Erica, uh, Jennifer alluded to the fact that there's a, it's a very attenuated chain here in terms of the connection between the terrorist act and 
what the platform allegedly did. did. And that's been a focus of some of the lower courts that have been dealing with ATA claims, sometimes that they don't decide on Section 230, but uh, talk about that attenuation and causation. Can you talk a little bit about how some of the courts below have sort of dealt with these cases? Uh, Yeah, there's been about uh, 20 plus cases filed that uh, basically involve the same set of facts. Uh, Terrorist attack, uh, uh, terrorist group uh, uh, had presence on social media and connect. Um, and they failed on four different grounds. They failed on the statutory question of whether the ADA, uh, the ATA even applies. They failed on Section 230 grounds. They failed on First Amendment grounds. And they failed on causation grounds. And that's what Jennifer was alluding to most recently, this question that, um, uh, you know, even if you could establish but for causation in the role of social media in causing the terrorist attack, you might very well have difficulty establishing proximate causation because of the fact that there's all these intervening things that have to happen between content being online and someone choosing to, uh, uh, to commit a terrorist attack. Um, so, uh, it, one of the reasons why I think many of us were surprised that the Supreme Court took the, uh, the two cases, um, is because of the fact that the lower courts had, had wiped them out on so many different grounds that ultimately we think these cases are never going to win because they can't navigate the full range of challenges uh, before them. And yet they might very well wreck a bunch of other legal doctrines before they reach their ultimate futility. <laughs> Great. Um, so we, we only have a few minutes left. So I wanted to give each of you a chance just at the end here to, um, you know, if you, if you could write your holding for the court, holding for the court in these cases, what's sort of your dream scenario here? Or conversely, what's your nightmare scenario in terms of what the court holds or does here? And um, Ambika, I'll begin with you. Okay. Um, I mean, I look in an ideal world, um, they would cleanly find that courts have correctly interpreted Section 230 to bar claims based on the arrangement, promotion, et cetera, of third-party content. I mean, what we're really talking about is a decision, a decision that belongs with Congress, um, not one that belongs with the courts. Um, and I think the courts so far have gotten it right, but I see significant risk that they won't. Um, uh, you know, in terms of nightmare holding, uh, they would, you know, substantially revise um, Section 230 immunity. I can see a variety of ways in which they would do that. I'm not sure which is the worst. <laughs> Too many nightmares to contemplate. Um, David, what your your dream and nightmare here? Sure. Yeah. And so I, I think I would like to see the court uh, interpret the, the text of the statute, looking cl- focusing closely on the text of the statute, because um, I think that is the path to a moderate decision here. Um, as, as saying that uh, a defendant is uh, receives immunity only if the claims, first, the claim seeks to treat the defendant as a publisher of another's improper content, and second, the defendant did not materially contribute to the impropriety. I'd like to see the court um, acknowledge that the neutral tools test does not have uh, a, a statutory foundation in the text. And my, you know, I think that there's two really bad outcomes that can happen here. The first is, of course, you could have a, a decision that blows up Section 230 either entirely or functionally, uh, and that ma- undermines the functioning of the internet as we know it. But the other scenario that I'm really concerned about is one that uh, effectively gives very, very broad immunity in such a way that it's impossible or near impossible, functionally impossible, to enforce civil rights violations online. I'm actually more concerned about that second one because if the court blows up Section 230, Congress is going to have to step in and fix it. Like something will have to happen. Uh, But if the court gives broad spectrum immunity uh, in a way that that makes it near impossible to enforce civil rights decisions, I'm not sure I see Congress coming back and fixing that. You're a little more optimistic about, about Congress than I am on the first scenario. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jennifer. I, I think that the court, I think you can have very broad immunity 
for publishing third party content and an expansive definition of publishing and also coexist with enforcement of civil rights laws. I think that that's I don't think those are inconsistent because I think um, hinging not on the definition of publisher, but on the definition of whether it's third party materials that are causing the illegality or it's the um, speech or conduct of the of the platform. I think we have to assert that there's a very broad definition of activities which constitute publishing, not only to you know, protect offline publishers that we're most familiar with, but also to enable the internet to be the kind of um, you know, amazing tool for speech that, that it has been. I think we can do, do both of those things. Um, uh, I, you know, and I think you know, the court, I, I think it's a little bit, it's possible, we don't know, but I think it, hopefully it's unlikely for the court to kind of stray beyond the question presented and stray beyond the, the, the party's briefing to reach issues that are not before it um, and that are you know, complicated and nuanced exactly as David said. I think probably the best thing the court could do is hold in Tamne that there's not sufficient scienter under the aiding and abetting provision of the ATA um, and then remand on the Gonzalez case as not, you know, basically moot, like they don't need to decide it because there wouldn't be liability anyway. Um, I'm not sure that we're at a point where we need more guidance because as, as Eric said earlier, there have been a, a score of cases analyzing this issue, um, you know, all of which have come out basically the same way. And I think that the objections we're seeing in dissent, like the dissent in force and in, you know, the Gonzalez case, I think those are policy disagreements and not really disagreements about the statutory interpretation. Great. And finally, Eric. Yeah, my ideal scenario is that the court would dig the Gonzalez case because the plaintiff changed the question presented from what it got the Supreme Court to grant cert on to a different question presented that it actually briefed. And uh, from my perspective, that alone is basis for the court to say this case is not right because the plaintiff can't even decide what it's asking us to do. Um, it, my other ideal scenario is that the court would say in Tamna that it's in never aiding and abetting to publish content. Um, just as a categorical rule, uh, whatever aiding and abetting means, publishing content isn't that. Um, my nightmare scenario is that the court will say in one of the net choice cases that uh, the First Amendment uh, allows le legislators to uh, uh, force services to carry content that they don't want, and simultaneously through Gonzalez eviscerate Section 230 so that Congress uh, couldn't um, uh, override uh, those statutes. Um, and so we could end up in a world where uh, not only are services required to carry content, but they receive no liability protection for it. And uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm going to be moving to my uh, uh, South uh, Pacific uh, Island uh, retreat with no internet at that point, because that won't be an internet I want to be on. Great. Well, that's a good way to close things. Um, let me close by thanking our panelists for their deep dive into the Gonzalez and Tomna cases, as well as those of you in the audience for attending. This concludes day two of FOSO, but there's more to come tomorrow when we're going to be broadening our lens in two ways. First, we'll take a look at these issues from a global perspective. The Supreme Court's not the only place where the action is. The EU, for example, has already passed a law, the Digital Services Act, that imposes various obligations around content moderation. So tomorrow we hear, we'll hear from Werner Stang, a senior official with the European Commission who will be closely involved with implementation of the DSA, followed by a panel that will put some of these issues in a global context. And then for our final panel, we'll look beyond social media to other layers in the internet stack and consider whether and when other types of infrastructure intermediaries should engage in content moderation. So please join us tomorrow and thanks again and have a good remainder of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you.